All right, let me share the link, and we should be live right now. I got all the stuff ready for uh, crypto. Okay. Okay. And yeah, we're good. All right. Well, hello everybody. It's Andre McClendon. Uh, just give me a second. I'm gonna be sending the links out, and uh, give me one minute, okay? Yeah, but today's discussion, we'll be talking about crypto, uh, technical analysis, and some politics when it comes to crypto, since it's a very uh, wild west market. But uh, we'll get into it in a few minutes. Some politics when it comes to crypto, since it's... Okay. Share. Copy my group. Ooh. Telegram. Boom. All right, here we go. But I actually, I want, I really want to get into the, this explosion of cryptos because I thought mm-hmm. we were at like twenty nine thousand. We're mm-hmm. at one point eight million cryptos now. What? I. <laughs> so so let me get this straight. NFTs died and cryptos exploded. Is that what's happened while I wasn't paying attention? Like this. <laughs> I, I've never heard, seen one point eight million. Like this doesn't even make any sense. That's an insane number of cryptos. All right, here, let me share my screen, guys. Sorry about talking and not sharing. Share screen. Window, entire screen. Here we go. Now, I thought this is this, this didn't even make any sense. Like, if you guys see the screen, guys, let me uh, present it. Here we go. So, since today's discussion is going to be about crypto, I really want to break down this right here. Like, the entire, there's 1.8 million cryptos out there. So if you guys are trying to get into the crypto market, you're going to have a lot of choices. Like, and I think most likely if you stay into the altcoin world, basically like anything out of the top 100, you might get hit with the scam. Holy snap. Let me see. There really is. One- <clears throat> 1.8 million is an intense number. So uh, I, I already have, I, I, you want to hear my rant about why I don't invest into crypto, Andre? Yeah, yeah, yeah. tell us why. Yeah, yeah, tell So us. Um, you're old enough that you remember Beanie Babies. Yep. <laughs> uh, s- some of these cryptos, uh, not all of them, some of them are essentially just Beanie Babies. Uh, and, and I know what I'm about to say might be a little scary, uh, but there's, there's a good light at the end of the tunnel here. Uh, have you ever heard of Tulip Mania? Yep, I like the Tulip mm-hmm. Bubble. Okay, yeah. So I want all the audience to go ahead and type into Google, you know, open a new tab or whatever. Tulip mania. Take a look at what happened. This was about 500 years ago. Uh, Tulips finally made it to Europe. Uh, They grew real well in Holland. Uh, That whole area, um, there was a craze, sort of like a gold rush on tulips. Uh, At the peak, you could turn in a single pristine tulip for like, I think I've heard numbers like eight cows or a medium sized house. For just one flower that's how much they were worth like like let that sink in we're talking you know three cars or something for a flower uh so the bubble burst and tulips have never been worth that much again you know still bullish on tulips you know that's the joke uh and so <clears throat> when you're dealing with an industry where you have way too many choices and it's hard to it's hard to value what's actually going on um, it's really hard to pick winners. Uh, that, that's a, a very difficult game. So uh, people like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, they've they've made their they've made their fortune by choosing rising stars in boring industries. Uh, that's actually a really easy game <laughs> to play. You know that that's a it, it, like I could teach a 15 year old how to play that game. That that is not that hard. Um, it's really hard to pick out the most competitive like company or asset or player in a competitive game uh it, that takes experience you have to have situational mm-hmm. awareness if, if you don't uh achieve situational awareness you'll never actually be able to um pick winners correctly right you'll, you'll just always be left in the dark uh and uh, a big part of the problem is that it's really hard to value some of these cryptos uh some of them <clears throat> have intrinsic value uh so uh, go ahead and pull up a, a chart for margin of safety just type in like margin of safety and, and you'll see a diagonal line and then a squiggly line. Uh, some cryptos have a, a purpose and oh, they have a function. In, in Google? Yeah, Google or wh- wherever. Just, yeah, Google search it. 
Uh, so so the cryptos that don't, I don't know have. What's going on. Mine's like. It, so any asset that doesn't have a function or a purpose, um, it doesn't have an intrinsic value. So if it has no intrinsic value, then it, by definition, it cannot ever have a margin of safety. And uh, I'd be willing to bet that almost all of the 1.8 million coins have no function <laughs> other than potentially being currency. Mm. Um so he, he, here's a concept from value investing here. You only want to buy things when they're well below their intrinsic value. You, you don't ever want to buy things that are above the intrinsic value, mm. right? Why, why would you walk into a store and buy something that's overpriced? You want to buy something that's underpriced. Uh, the problem is any, any asset that doesn't have an intrinsic value n can never have a margin of safety. So that means you, I can't touch it. And you, you also should avoid those. A and so when you're assessing cryptos, whether or not mm. you should buy, you should ask yourself, does this coin have some sort of function? Can I infer or extrapolate some kind of intrinsic value out of this thing where in the future it's going to serve a purpose? Um, otherwise, you're just playing the greater fool theory. Where the, the only thing, the only reason this thing is worth any money is because somebody else is going to come along and pay more for it uh, on the hopes that it will go up, right? And, and they will sell it to someone who will pay more for it on the hopes that it will go up. If it doesn't have some kind of, uh, Warren Buffett would call it a durable competitive advantage. If, if it doesn't serve some sort of purpose that people mm. actually need, uh, there's no point in touching it. Um, and so any of you listening, if, if you can like, you know, see the forest for the trees and actually tell which ones are functional and which ones will be around in 10 or 20 years. Uh, so a big part of the story is um, in 1908, when Henry Ford opened up his plant, there were over 125 uh, auto manufacturers in the Detroit area. Uh, by 1980, sorry, by 1948, uh, maybe it was 47, but I think it was 48. There were we, we were just left with the big three. And so uh, mm. that winnowing down of companies from, from 1908 to 1948, um, I'm not even sure if crypto's there yet. Like, I don't even know if Henry Ford, you know, the Henry Ford of crypto has, has come along and revolutionized the industry yet. We might be in like mm. 1904, you know, like, or 1900, like, I don't know how much longer, or, or it's already like 1910, and somebody founded that that ultimate coin that's going to be like the one coin to rule them all, like two years ago, it's just nobody nobody knows it yet. So this is another part of the problem with crypto, is, is I can't even tell you where we're at in the story. Like, that, that's a huge problem. So I cannot invest in crypto, but you can trade crypto. Like you can make a lot of money trading crypto. It doesn't, it's not all coins have high frictional costs. Some do, some don't. I know Andre, you probably know a whole lot more about that than I do because you actually trade crypto. Yeah. Mm. But uh, a, I'll you, say when it, oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, if you can find a volatile asset with low frictional costs, you can make a lot of money trading it. And that goes for any asset, mm. including crypto, including the shittiest coin ever. You can make money trading it. All right, I think I'm done ranting. Actually, to, <laughs> to go into a little bit more of what you're saying, yeah. basically the intrinsic value, since yeah, there's yeah. so much, let's just go off some very obvious ones too. I can't tell you guys what to do, but let's look at some cryptocurrencies that have scam in the name. And literally, okay. if you okay. read a lot of these cryptos, they yeah. have, this crypto is a scam. Like they'll tell you in the description. It's like a scam in the description. And people will buy this crypto. Still, yes. yeah. That's funny. So it's and a meme at that point. They're just buying a meme. Meme. Ugh. Well, it's kind of like Dogecoin. It's, it's, it's the same concept. Like there's very little difference between that and some of these main tokens. But if See, you like would, read it, through these, like. <clears throat> it, it, if I was going to create a crypto, it, it would be called scam coin. And the whole point of it would, would be to send to scammers or someone you think is a potential scammer. And then they would get their scam coin in their wallet, and then they would have to go like verify their actual identity with a local authority or something, make mm. sure there's no act active warrants or anything. And then they can get the actual value of what you sent them from like a third party, like a bank or something. Uh, and then that way you can try not to get ripped off by actual scammers, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> 
Uh, I mean, introduce, well, the whole like, point of the introducing scam. Yeah. Yeah, the whole point of, of my scam coin concept would be to try to produce an extra barrier of protection. Uh, and so you just like store it in a secondary wallet and uh, send it to anybody who you thought was suspicious. And after they had a chance yeah. to like verify their ID with some official, they'd get actual money. Anti scam so, coins. Like there you go. There you go. Yeah. Here, here's this, an industry that might be worth it. I made a video about this. Yeah. <laughs> this, is a, this, is a, this is a scam. Oh, the anti-scam scam coins. I'll say. Line. I'll say that they're they are scams. <laughs> <laughs> they're all scams. Yeah. So if it doesn't like, serve, I, a I made a couple videos about like meme. Hmm. If it if well, it doesn't serve a function, like uh, here, you 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 know Squid Games. Uh, I know of the TV show. I mean, and and yeah. the Mr. Beast thing. Yeah, that, 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 that was... that's what I'm talking about right there. So they made a cryptocurrency called Squid Games, right? The, the function okay. of it at the time was to reanimate the same scene, right? Okay. So let's look at the chart. So they they had a function. Their function was to raise funding to create the same scenes like in the TV show, right? Okay. <laughs> oh, to recreate so, the TV well, we're show. we're going to look at the... Yeah. <sighs> that's so not a function. The chart, you'll see that... What the... <laughs> that's a Kickstarter. That's not a function. That's a Kickstarter. That's not... And they need to serve a and function. And used to buy like, like, and is used to buy crypto. Uh, used to buy uh, their paraphernalia, their merchandise and stuff in their yeah. ecosystem. <laughs> yeah. So, they have a use, but is it actually of any value? Like, yeah, I, yeah. When you start like how much is circulating and how much the total supply is, like, mm -hmm. is the charts even? Oh wow, the charts are gone on this now. <laughs> Maybe... Did it? Did it get delisted it went up or like, whatever? It, it, they don't delist it. They keep it on the but it went up like this and then like point zero zero zero. It's like it's like fifteen zeros and then one. <laughs> fifteen zeros. <laughs> like here, I I'll bring up the chart for you. It is like I I was like when this came out, when Squid Games came out, I was like, okay. Uh -huh. If you guys are gonna buy this cryptocurrency, please watch out because this might go it won't go to zero, but it'll go down so small that it'll be near zero. Like Oh. Is it easy to short crypto, or are there a this? lot of fees or whatever? Like wh which you short I'm crypto, your broker. Whew. Big cryptos, there's no problem. Small cryptos, okay. are dangerous. Like the big names, it's it's not a problem. Well, because they could squeeze at any yeah, moment, not... you know. Like, I don't expect Bitcoin to triple overnight, but some of the tiny coins could. Yeah, they can, and that's why the yeah. spreads are. Quite massive. Yeah. Squid games. Oh, so crypto. Gosh. Stuff like this is like there's a Will Smith token. There's like a <laughs> cryptocurrency for every celebrity. Yeah, no thank you. <laughs> and balance symbol now? Wow, yeah, they did take it all. Here. Will Smith is probably one of my favorite cryptos because it's such a mm -hmm. why, who would buy this? You... But do you want to do some TA on like Bitcoin or anything? I, I hear it's having a good yeah. weekend. Oh yeah, it's actually doing really good. I got a lot. I got a lot of trades happening right because it's because it's breaking thirty thousand and people are like it's on the bull run. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I, Twitter's blowing up all over it, and I don't I don't really pay much attention to Bitcoin, but I mean I'm on Twitter just a little bit, so it's hard not to see other people celebrating. I, I would just tell people if you want to see how the how Bitcoin reacts. Compare Bitcoin's chart and stimulus checks. You oh yeah. The chart. It's, it's oh perfect. yeah. <laughs> just wait. Just wait until the Fed starts quantitative easing, because that's that's what. If I was going to buy <laughs> Bitcoin, like I I would buy Bitcoin right then. Like, and and personally, I would not buy Bitcoin. I would just buy like Riot and Mara, uh, or I would just buy calls mm. on on Riot and Mara. Um, but like, if I want exposure to Bitcoin, um, oh my, that that's actually a a pretty chart yeah uh, i mean i i was I, I was making videos all buying through this right here this madness and and the reason why i buy bitcoin and cryptocurrency is not for the big reason mine is international sending you know sending of funds and protection against the government that's like the two main reasons why i like crypto. Mm -hmm. it's everything else man like it, it, it just you, have, uh, have it you installed very annoying have you installed mm -hmm. thinkorswim yet yeah, I actually do have it on my computer. 
if you pull up thinkorswim i can show you how to look at everything in volume profile i know you were pretty interested in that the other day and you can look at the volume profile on bitcoin and then the other see. thing the other indicator that we didn't get to talk to when we were on thb's channel the other day was anchored vwap and vwap uh, VWAP will probably be pretty useless to you because you like to trade continuously traded markets like oh, crypto and commodities. On, and it, it depends on which market. Uh, I okay. literally, if you if you saw my other markets, I have like sixty robots running. They, yeah, they but I, I just all I assets. Thought, okay, a variety of assets. Okay, okay. Well, v, VWAP is super useful on markets that uh like open and close every day. You know, like stocks and stuff like that. Uh, anchored VWAP is really useful for like continuously traded markets like commodities and crypto and and whatnot. Uh, are are you used for to sure. using either of those? For me, the main things that I use like here, actually, let me just read it to you. Oh, I know you use ATR and you use like a whole slew of other indicators no. that you've custom built. ATR, ATR is the only indicator that I have publicly disclosed that I use. Everything else I, is custom. I, I understand. There, I, I, I've taught myself about 50 different trading strategies, and I'm only good at like five of them or something like that, four or five. Uh, one of them I refuse to talk to people about at all because it only works in low liquidity markets. And as soon as I start explaining to people how this works, those markets might not be low liquidity anymore. So uh, it's I have one top secret trading strategy and everything else I'll talk about. I'll say, uh, what's your community? Combine enough strategies and you average out. That's what I usually try to go for. There's, yeah. there's a lot of strategies that people that, that do work, but they only work mm -hmm. in certain environments. Kind of like, a, like yes. A, yes. For example, there's actually something interesting when it comes to robotics. I oh, know robotics uh, automation. A lot of the robots that I program for clients and use, most of them, they're strategies that, that just don't work. Like certain well, strategies, like support resistance. <clears throat> it's whatever the client wants. In like, yeah. In ranging markets. Only. Like equities, it works. Forex to me, it, it doesn't even work. Equities, it works beautiful. It works a lot better in equities than in forex. Uh, forex is just gets massacred. I very much understand why it doesn't work in forex. Is because the the pull and push forces that are behind forex markets are much stronger than stock markets. No, much no, much stronger. Yeah. Even though they're and more liquid. Then the, the worst part is that your broker, your your broker will sell you off pretty, pretty oh with forex yeah it's so annoying all right i'm pulling up my finger oh, swim he, 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 and and if you get more. yours pulled up too I, I can show you like what settings uh yeah it's like every time i do stream yard my computer runs very very slow it doesn't like it. Maybe you don't have enough RAM Computer. or virtual RAM. Maybe you're running low on virtual RAM and not not uh, I have like uh, like sticker RAM. It's I'm gonna keep joking. It's those fifty bots you got running in the background. I have. A... You have a separate server oh, for that. I know that's they're not running right now. It's only like it's only like oh, okay six running right now. It, it's a weekend. Yeah. A weekend. So the weekend only like uh, only crypto is open. Are commodities not open on weekends? I thought they traded on weekends too. Trading, trading only a, a physical bullion. Okay. Yeah. Oh, give me a second. Where is this coming at? Uh, yeah, trading. I mean, I, I mean, I buy commodities usually when the markets all uh, close, anyways. Mm -hmm. That's more. Are you waiting on your thinker swim to uh, load? It it takes a couple minutes. It just it's just loading. Okay. All right, now I'm back. There we go. I want to give you a password. <laughs> it's interesting. Like uh, the, the, if we uh, change this to a yield Mac talk, I think everybody would be on. We'll just wait four months from now when like Bitcoin is ripping and this gets a whole lot of hits because you know it's an old video talking about it or whatever. Mm. Especially right now because I told like the activity that's happening right here. I mean, just from bars length, 
-hmm. this will, to me, it, it will, it will go higher, not because of any value. It's just, it's going higher because it's people are just, uh, FOMO, FOMO. They're, pu they're pushing it up. They're pushing it up. So personally, I, I would look for it to break above the current range and then to retest the top of the range. And then I would, I would consider getting in after that. I mean, I'd stack once every week, just buy, 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 buy. And this was with leverage positions, not with the uh, uh, cash positions. Mm -hmm. I can't, it, it's, it's weird. Like after years of trading, I, I can't buy things one-to-one -one anymore. Mm -hmm. I can only buy with leverage because why, why the fuck would I buy one-to-one? -one? <laughs> I don't want to own Bitcoin unless I'm moving money. For me, guys, I think when it comes to Bitcoin, whoever's the next president, it doesn't matter. I think that they're going to pump the markets even more. We're going to have a massive quantitative easing. I, I can't wait to be there. can't wait to be in Bitcoin this time around. Yeah. I, actually, um, I, I wish, I wish how, much, how much we're going to be doing the next stimulus check. I, I wonder how much it's going to be. It's going to be such a beautiful thing. Actually, let me, uh, let me find the next bar. I wish I can just do this on my computer, but I cannot do it on there. Does Thinkorswim allow us to do uh, boxes like this? Like kind of like a, a rank um, look? Yeah, you, you can you can draw rectangles and stuff. It has about 400 built-in indicators, uh, and then it lets you um, custom build your own indicators. It's actually a really powerful tool. I, oh. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep pushing you to like get used to using it, just because a a rather large uh, portion of retail uses it. And then what I do like about this, uh, for trading view, at least they allow me to copy this stuff over so I can use it later. All right. So I need my, I need my, I need my right here. Here. Yeah, Let's I was see. right. Yeah. So if Bitcoin does go up, guys, let's say hypothetically, let's say it, it builds up into these zones, like basically expansion, accumulation, expansion, accumulation, it just keeps on accumulating. Mm -hmm. And if the I, what I like, this is what I love about Bitcoin. When the news gets on Bitcoin, it just like a, it just pops up like, hey, Bitcoin's breaking thirty thousand. Break, break. Yeah, this is how we had this big run up last time. Right here. Yeah, there will there will be a lot of momentum. Like, well, I, I the news. It was like cryptocurrency. So I, I don't know if that big run up last time is going to happen in the near future because that was during the easy money era when everybody had stimmy cash. Mm -hmm. Before inflation started rearing its ugly head, Look at that. Look at that. I'm trying to figure out how to how to view Bitcoin on Ooh. Thinkorswim. Accumulation zone. Ooh, I mean, if I put some easy indicators on there, like the SSL, the SSL is a very simple one. SSL channel. So hybrid, uh, we can do hybrid. Uh, let's do it to linear. <clears throat> I'm going to try to pull up Bitcoin in my thinkorswim and, and show you the mm. volume profile on it. Um, take a look at Anchor BWAP. It, it should be one of the built-in uh, trading view indicators because you're using trading view. Mm. It loads. Right. Oh, your thinkorswim? No, not. I mean, I could load on here. Give me a second. Oh, what, whatever. I, I'm going to pull mine up so I can show you volume profile. It's not even loading. And this is why. <clears throat> Another reason why trading big is annoying. Yeah, th thinkorswim takes a while, and trading view also lags. Yeah, so and it's actually interesting when I see people trade from here, like they trade from from trading view. That's insanity. Yeah. No way. Yeah, it's not even on there. I mean, I usually call cap on most traders that say they trade from trading view because uh uh they never I have, show uh, an initiation. <clears throat> I have two screens up and I'm looking at like fifteen charts and I wish I had six screens in this room. Uh it, it's like that. 
six grand. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, six, six. Uh, you have six, yeah. If if I had my ideal setup would be six screens, and my wife thinks I'm crazy, and that's that's what it would take. That's what that's what scalpers need is is a bunch of information from a bunch of different scalp. places. Oof. Oh, it's it's I mean, a rough I, I, game. It's I a scalp, rough. Game. But I think it's been, I think it's been like five years since I scalped manually. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm trying to uh, get you to write me a bot so that you can you can help me write a bot that trades like I do, so I don't have to scalp manually anymore. You would have to like analyze to see if you can uh, perform on a uh, on a spread basis so uh, like I, uh, <clears throat> other brokers have like very tight spreads or zero spreads you have to find a perfect broker for a scalping strategy um i'm happy with with the the program just throwing limits in that are slightly above the ask like mm. like one penny or one penny or one dollar above the ask since since i'm talking about spy options and i'm going to be each each option is about like at the monies or like two to three hundred dollars or something. So I'm willing to pay an extra dollar just to get filled really quick. And so instead of doing market orders, uh, I'd be willing to bet that if you if you dive into your coding books, you'd be able to find that the right lines of code that would that would let the program just instantly pay just a dollar above the ask every time. And sometimes you'll get price improvement, sometimes not. It'd be interesting because I'm going to spy right now. It would be difficult to find a broker that can actually use this one. Actually, let me try my new one. Give me a second. My Italian broker. Let's see if they can. Your Italian this. broker. You're trying to trade spy options on an Italian broker? Oh, no, not the spy. They can do other assets that I couldn't get into, other commodities, mm -hmm. other stocks, foreign stocks. Oh. I love trading outside. Because if, if, I, if I showed you a United States broker, you only get like 50 assets, 60 assets. Mm -hmm. Here you get hundreds. Stuff I couldn't even touch before. But now I can, I can actually uh, actually trade these in other currencies. Man, finally. No. I'm, nope. I think the only thing I can mess with is just the big, big indexes, a few ETFs in the States. Mm -hmm. I wish I could do yield max. I all gosh, yield max would be so easy. So things that are like smaller and harder to, like harder, like they're less liquid markets are less likely to have access on foreign brokers and stuff. Like yield max is just pretty new. You might have to wait six more months or something until you can find a foreign broker that's willing to let you transact on it. <laughs> it goes down fifty percent lower. <laughs> yeah, it, I would not short it because it pays fatter than it falls. Uh, but it's still like it'd be a good idea to buy puts or something. Puts with my with my broker, if they gave me a thousand to one, and I got paid pretty high uh, commission fees with it, the, the shorting to me would be better. Mm -hmm. the, the movements are so quick, and oh, I can lever up so high on this. Uh, you, yeah, I really like options because you can get asymmetrical risk reward and leverage at the same time, and I don't have to use stops if I keep my cost like my size small. Uh, then the entire entry is is the risk, so I don't have to stress about like trailing stops or any of that. I just have to <clears throat> manually babysit it, and uh, I have psych I use psychological stops, meaning my broker doesn't know what my stop is. I know what my stop is, and I I shift it up and down as the market behaves. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't have a problem where I, where I'm like stubborn and hold on to losers. I, I don't have that problem. <laughs> I, my, my problem is actually slightly the other direction where I, I should, should be just a little bit more stubborn, uh, but I'm too scared of losing money. I don't like taking losses or large losses. So I have um, so <clears throat> for the last several months, I'm complaining about how many winners I'm, I'm walking away from. You see the ch you see the chat? There's a guy named, I don't even know how to say his name, NSNSN, WNSN, calling me Baldy. And you got to build the audience first before you go live. Well, I usually don't go live on my channel unless it's for a client. So most of my lives are just for clients. I think it's more of a THB thing, the going live. Me, mm -hmm. my channel is usually for clients only, which I prefer. That's where the money's at. Yeah, my last, last live stream, I have 
twice as many views as I have subscribers on it. I'm not surprised. Hmm. Yeah. It, it depends on what you're going for. Like I live stream trading robots uh -huh. to compare which one is better or not. Most people don't even show their trading live results of P&L. They, they don't show anything about trading at all. I will literally mm -hmm. will show people why certain strategies are there because my focus is trading and investing. Most just do, what, what is that called? Like just talk about finance and never actually show finances? Yeah, exactly. Kind of like exactly. A, what is it? Kind of like the, uh, like, uh, what's his name? Uh, it's, it's a, he's short. Uh, he's on YouTube. He's a finance guru. His name is uh, Graham Stephan. Like Kevin. Graham Stephan. Graham Stephan, like that. Yeah. So talk, not Graham... that he's a bad guy. Like he talks about finances. Yeah, he, he thoroughly researches things, but he's certainly not like the world's leading expert or anything. You know, he's he's mm. fairly well informed, but I wouldn't listen to him for a whole lot of topics. Like if I want to do a specific deep dive on something, he, he is not a person mm. I would go to for any one topic. Uh, but if you're if you're brand new mm. and completely financially illiterate, he's not a horrible person to listen to. There, there are way worse grifters. Uh, on the grifter scale. <laughs> uh, yeah, way worse, way worse than him. Um, so if you go to the personal chat in the Discord, I just posted three pictures of Bitcoin volume profile. All right, I'm there right now. And uh, let me see, open it up. Yeah, so it just, it just depends, man. Like I said, like if you're in a very specific niche, it will, it, it helps to talk about this mm -hmm. stuff because most people don't trade. They only talk about stuff like Grand Seven. Andre, I will talk to you about trading all you want. Ooh, look at this. This is a beautiful chart. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is a thinkorswim chart. I have a specific script that I can dig through a file. I have a file of scripts somewhere, and I'll send you, I'll send you the script. So the first one is, I think, let me take a look. It's a one-year, one-day chart. So this is the volume profile for the last year. Hmm. Um, it, the and I know I've already explained this to Andre once, but I'm going to give the aud audience a chance to hear this. Um, so volume profile lets you see recent fair value and where a large number of traders have transacted in the past and agreed on price. And when price is in momentum, like it's trending, when it reaches a high volume node, like the peaks of the mountains, um, it's basically not allowed to just blow right through it. It has to at least pause and transact there for a while because the market makers won't let it go basically is the short answer but uh, there's so much volume waiting to get transacted there that it takes to time for that to resolve before it's allowed to move up uh, the high volume nodes also have like this rubber band effect it's very magnetic uh, so once price gets like into a high volume node it usually takes a lot of news to get it out of the high volume node uh, in the stock market usually these news you're looking at like earnings reports, stuff like mm. that. Uh, with Bitcoin, um, that's actually a huge advantage with crypto. Uh, there's no real, like not a whole lot of different types of news events that'll move a crypto. So you never have to worry about like the CEO dying in a car wreck. You know, that's just like not a problem. Uh, so, so that is a, an advantage where news is unlikely to do that. Um, so the low volume nodes there, uh, when price enters low volume nodes, it stays trending, uh, typically. I have seen many times where it'll just pause in the middle of a high volume node and hang out and start filling it in. But most of the time, when it enters a, high, a low volume node, it'll continue trending. If you look at the candlesticks from back in December and January and March, do you see? can you see that, on, Andre, on your screen? I'm gonna say I'm I'm, I'm t texting this guy right now. He's sure. In the chat talking about why I won't grow, and I'm like, I just went up like 800 subscribers. It's crazy. I worked for a finance dude uh, with around 70k thousand subscribers, I, and I can see why you don't grow. Well, usually people in finance usually are grifters. Like I can go through hundreds of YouTube channels that don't talk about anything. I can't count the number of financial advisors who I've met who try to sell people whole life insurance. And it's like the most unethical bullshit on the planet. So, you like, know. I just tell me like, I, I'm one of the only channels on YouTube that will show a live PL, a live trading, and how it's programmed. Mm -hmm. All live. Like, it's not a big deal for me because I actually trade live. Yes, I show my losers. It's not a big deal. I show losing on live stream for eight hours. Yeah, you sh you should just go you know, check his live streams where you can watch his robots trade yeah. for hours and hours. 
Yeah. yeah, I mean, and, and then clients will contact me saying, hey, how does this work? Well, I'll tell them the same thing. How yeah. Wall Street has a bunch of computers running, I do the exact same thing. Yeah. I, I know it's not popular, but I just tell them, like, is that, that's not my purpose. It, it's a niche. There's a significant number of traders that trade using automation or semi-automation where, like, they get an alert and stuff like that. They're all losers. But wait, wait. I'm like this guy. No, I'm yeah, saying... I, I think we agree with you. Most of the really large finance YouTubers are all a bunch of scammers. Yeah. Yeah. I think almost almost <laughs> every forex. I mean, you know what? You know, I, I don't want to uh, drive this off, but I actually want to say this real quick. Yeah, we Here. can pause. Let this me show you something. Yeah. Let me show you this, guys. If a forex trader or any trader does not show you a PL or a live trading of anything, I'll show you this, guys. These are the biggest scammers out there. Like, for example, and I'll call them out. Q Banks, forex scammer. Mm -hmm. He has never showed a live trade. Mm -hmm. He NL. He will. He would. This is how the video comes up. One, they got a lot of tattoos, a lot of jewelry, a lot of girls. Oh they got yeah. That car oh in. yeah. It, it's like lifestyle, 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 lifestyle. Ten, like five minute clip of or two minute clip of the video of mm -hmm. trading, and it's like, look at this. I have a I have a a, a photo a photoshopped picture of a hundred thousand dollar trade, on the dot. Like it's not like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's like a hundred thousand exact. <laughs> you know what would impress me a lot more is if they were to open their brokerage statement for the year, like on camera, <laughs> live, open it up, show the world what your P&L is for last year. You know, that like if I'm going to sell myself as a trading guru, mm. like ever, you know, like in the future, there's no way I'd be willing to willing to do that unless I yeah. was willing to also show off like actual returns, you know. Mm. On camera, live stream, me opening my PL for the world to watch. I'm like, I mean, I'm going through like every single person on here can be easily exposed by any live trade. Except, to, see, this is one trader that I will say that I know he live trades, but I don't know he's profitable. Yeah, there, so there's also, a, oh, there's also a large category of traders that are knowledgeable and experienced, but not, they like, they don't work well under stress. Mm. They, you know, they're not going to do well live trading, you know, and, uh, Wow. Like they don't have the right psychology for it. What do you think about this? A hundred dollars to a million. I mean, <laughs> are you Without gonna wait? A Is that no like seventy years of investing right there? Because you could do it over like seventy years of investing. Like you know, Mamba like FX is <laughs> like he's a clear example of someone who makes a lot of money trading, selling courses and Telegram services without showing any type of results. Like yeah. I'm saying, like like. When I look at the chat and this guy talks about like, you know, growing or not, I'm saying that like a lot of these people, they are, they, 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 yeah, they they're are fakes. very good at tailoring to yeah. the common person. Yeah. Oh, like uh, Chris Sane. Are you familiar with Chris Sane? He just well, talks people into like, like extremely dumb options trades. And like, when you listen to him talk about options, he, he clearly does not know what he's talking about. Uh, S A I N Chris Sane. Yeah. Chris yeah. Yeah, his his channel is is straight cancer. It it is it is like the cesspit of fucking YouTube finance. Because not only is he lying to people, he's incompetent. So like, yeah. At least if you're gonna grift, know what you're talking wow. about, please. <laughs> he's five hundred thousand subscribers. Woo! Yeah, 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 yeah. But look at how many views he gets per video. You're supposed to get like a tenth of your subscribers per. You know, like if you have a healthy channel and a healthy audience. Yeah. So you, you should be able to basically take your subscriber count divided by 10, and that should be pretty close to your average viewer count per video. So he's had a huge falling off because almost all of his subscribers are tired of losing all their fucking money because <laughs> he gives out such horrible advice. It's it's just wicked bad. Oh, well, TSLA, when they sleep, you eat. Oh, man, you know what? If I ever DM this guy and just ask him a simple question, hey, do you have a... Do you have a, a P and L or open anything that showed you that you actually trade? I guarantee mm -hmm. you'll be like, no, I don't. <clears throat> the, the one thing I love, they'll say like, no, uh, I don't do that anymore. I used mm -hmm. to I'm like, what's the problem? Well, you guys can get a, access to my account. Like, no, you don't. No, <laughs> no, 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 yeah. no. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. Um, uh -oh. uh, the, the one guy in the chat whose name I just can't try to pronounce. You can check me out on tip ranks. Type in Blake Downer tip ranks. In fact, Andre, pull me up on tip ranks. If what you want to ask if I understand what I'm talking about, I'm beating like 90% of the rest of the analysts on the planet. And I'm just some schmuck on his couch. 
Tip, tip, tip ranks. T T I P R A N K S. Okay, here we go. Could you do more back? You, you could drop most valuable info, but the videos are engaging aren't engaging. Enough. No one will Nobody watch. Will yeah, care. he is right that I, because we're we're not trying to sell people on the idea that they can, they can get rich with nothing that we're not going to get a huge audience. But I'd rather tell the truth. My, my favorite YouTuber on this platform talks yeah. about the things that no one wants to talk about and he doesn't have he has like 200,000 subscribers but mm -hmm. the thing is that people watch like he's one of the only verified traders that I've seen on YouTube but when I mean verified yeah. like he'll bring up his live account in front of you. yeah so if if I was going to ever try to sell myself as a trading guru I would live stream the market I just can't figure out how to do it because they all yep. want to show my my account number like all my brokerage softwares it's a, my account number is just plastered all over the fucking screen. So like, I really can't live stream my account number. I, I can't do that. Someone will brute force their way into my account and, oh, and I can't. So that's me. And, and, and let me tell you, I'm not actually super good. Everyone else just fucking sucks like really bad. Uh, take a look at the numbers hmm. there. Like, look at, look at how, how far I am up on the, on the totem pole. And uh, let me tell you, most financial advisors are not worth their salt. What are your aims for subscribers? <laughs> you just ask them, like, <laughs> what are my yeah, aims? Most... My business yeah. is to, like, I, my goal is to own a business and own my own uh, platform. Like, I manage an account right now. I manage traders right now. So my goal is to open up my own ETF and open up my own private bank. Mm -hmm. When it comes to, when it comes to, like, becoming a big YouTuber, if you look at my content, it, it's not like these other YouTubers because... Once mm -hmm. again, I'm not selling a lifestyle. I actually yeah, yeah. trade full time, yeah. literally. If you see right. at the bottom of my screen, you see one, two, three, four, well, five. I have uh, six terminals of trading. Uh, Andre, right. your lifestyle is that you have kids and you don't have a job and you're doing just fine. You don't need to like Lamborghini right. and check out my vacation uh, permanency. And you know, you just just sell the whole like I don't have to stress about bills. Like that's mm. that ought to bring in people just fine. Just let them know, you know, once they learn how to trade and stuff. Yeah, but, I mean, and then, like I said, I've gone over trading videos and ideas. But what I've noticed, if I create a video just like theirs, which is not hard, because I, I have three, I have two editors working for me right now. I can create mm -hmm. the same videos, but they won't convey any information. Yeah. They're not saying anything. Like literally, if I made a video about how to trade forex correctly, I made a video of how to trade forex correctly step by step got very low views because the main thing is that people don't want to wait two years for one trade yeah yeah no well one I, who... I yeah i will i i i have i'm in the middle of that right now actually so uh you're gonna think this is crazy andre but uh in early 2020 2021 when the cannabis market ripped really hard and everything mm -hmm. went into overvalued i decided i was gonna like turn that into become make that industry into my circle of competence so i'm an engineer i've got a lot of background i, I do a lot of uh like most of my stock picks are on like engineering and technology based companies because those are in my wheelhouse so when cannabis ripped really hard it was super clear to me that cannabis was was super super cyclical and prone to euphoria based rallies and so in 2021, when everything was overvalued, I began, I began studying the sector. And, and uh, so <clears throat> there, there was about 300 cannabis companies when I started. And back to my Henry Ford speech from earlier, when Ford built the uh, first Model T factory, there were 125 companies in the Detroit area. And 40 years later, there were only three. So cannabis is sort of going through the same thing. And uh, so I did a bunch, bunch of research and I picked out the absolute most competitive business model in the entire industry and i literally waited two years to start to start buying it and then i've been buying it for like months now and and i'm i'm telling you this is this is the way to you know this is the way right this is the way to do things is you do your research and you wait until the time is right and then you buy yeah especially you talking about main thing is uh, high tide correct oh yeah high tide yeah yeah what did your robots tell you about it i i, I talked it all up oh actually uh give me one second i'm talking yeah. to this guy right now i asked him Hey, um, I don't know how to say your name, but listen, if you know how to grow and be authentic, let me know. Maybe I'm yeah, doing it yeah. incorrectly. But yeah, yeah. I, I'm almost at 4,000 subscribers. And you know what? I don't do good on live streams, but my videos do pretty good in, in general. Yeah. 
So you know what? It doesn't matter to me so much because there's I'm not going to be a Graham Stephan. My yeah. content will yeah. never be that way. I'll probably yeah. hit at like what 50k subscribers, but at least I'll own a bank. <laughs> you own a bank. <laughs> so, or I mean, I right now manage like eight clients. Right now, I legally mm -hmm. trade for them. I I can open and close positions for them at any time I want it. Mm -hmm. But they're overseas clients. Yeah, I don't do that crap in the states, man. Absolutely. Well, I I'm pretty sure it's it's totally legal as long as you don't have a single American client. Hmm? Yeah, you can't have American yeah, clients. That's what that's what it is. Yeah, as soon as you have an American client, you're violating all sorts of laws and blah blah. blah. But as soon as you're like, no, no, it's all overseas, then it's it's fine. Huh? And then, like, it, it, even if you, I wrote that into Forex, well, I'm sorry, I wrote that in, like, watch. I'll right, show you this. Here's a live trade that I did that I'm currently doing right now. It's called mm -hmm. Pound Yen. Mm -hmm. I, I did this live stream. I told people, like, hey, if you buy this, I will give you near not, near 100%. Like, near 100%, you're going to 10x your account. Here, I'll show you why. J Pound, uh, GBP, JPY. It's one of my favorite trades. Like I've been in this trade for like four years. Haven't even executed. Oh, yeah. you, you mean one trade? Like you entered it four one years trade, ago. Four years and four I years stack ago. every month yeah. on it. Every single month yeah. I enter in. Okay, and that this is me what are the two oh, tickers? What? The pound versus the what? Uh JPY. Pound yen. It pays me daily interest. It means I get paid well, no matter where the market goes, I get paid. You uh day. by JPY, uh, you mean the the yen or something? What is JPY? Oh yeah, JPY is yen. J it's the yen. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm not a forex trader, so I don't know the tickers. Um, so, so Japan heavily, heavily modifies the value of their money. They have some of the most manipulated currency on the planet. They have decided to try to peg it to try to fight the fact that the they've had such a big problem with the lost decades. Um, I don't really know enough about the Japanese currency manipulation to tell you, um, like long term how it's going to trend out or anything like that. But I know that they peg it like to do to behave a certain way like to to affect their economy in certain in the same way that our our fed plays with the interest rates japan will also play with the value of their <laughs> money wow look at this I, this was 10 months ago look at the price you know what this mm -hmm. is so weird this guy is live streaming his own trade on here but if i go to google <laughs> i'm sorry go to youtube and do the exact same thing watch what listen, listen to me no you know, one else is like, live streaming their people, trades yeah yeah <laughs> They all people want is that yeah. butter that that instant jolt of like ah, I want to be a millionaire I want to yeah. make a million dollars from yield max but if I say hey yeah, they guys want, you're doing yield they max want the wrong. promise yeah they want the yeah, promise like, like I can grift pretty damn good because I know what I'm talking about but it, it's very right. tiresome talking about like 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 when you see people like this this oh, can this be a scammer making twenty five thousand on pound yen and by keeping it simple. So when you mm -hmm. go through the video, like, oh, okay, this guy took the same trade as I did. And I'm going through it. I'm like, I don't see any trade taken. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't see any order of execution ever. Taken. Yeah. Yeah. No, like thank this. you. You see my, you actually can see my ID number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, if, if, what else do you want? Like, what yeah. else? So and if you want like to go back like, to. If you want to go All back right. to Bitcoin technical analysis, we can we can switch back to the main topic of the video. Oh, <laughs> oh my god! You're gonna have to Thank you. you're gonna have I to timestamp you're gonna have to timestamp this whole tangent that we just went on. <laughs> Bitcoin USD. Oh my gosh! Yeah, we just spent ten minutes I mean, ripping on scammers. Even though, <laughs> god, it like, I'll tell you, man. Like, I I, I know you. It depends on what your content. I, I sound like this. There's a lot. There's a reason why some people grow, some people don't. But I think the main yeah. reason why I didn't grow very early in my career on YouTube is because I was too political. I yeah, I will yeah, go like when Ukraine yeah. had that issue, I'll make a whole video about Ukraine. Yeah, you, sh why? you should stay in stay in your niche and don't <laughs> leave your niche. You, YouTube hates it when you leave your niche. But you can expand again, your niche, like you can push it out. Pull back up the charts I was talking about that I put in the Discord. Where's Discord at? Oh yeah, boom. Yeah, and the kind of zoom in on the business. Oh well, no, no, leave it, leave it how it is. Um, so I, I was in the middle of First. a, uh, of a spiel on, on volatility. There you go. Okay, so if you'll notice, Andre, um, when price ends up at the tops of the peaks in the high volume nodes, 
there's a whole lot of like magnetism and rubber band effect going on there. And so you will get a lot of low volatility and it will like stay in ranges and then shift to a new range and then stay in a range and shift to a new range. When price enters the low volatility zones, it gets real volatile and it moves real hard. And uh, you can take a look over what was going on in like January, February, March when price was in a low volatility, low volume zone, Very. right? Yeah, you see, you see, yeah, look at the correlations. Huge fucking candlesticks. That's, that is, this is a big part of why volume profile is such a powerful tool, is when price enters into high volume nodes and low volume zones, it changes its behavior. And it's, it's this usually extremely predictable. And I don't mean like, you know what direction it's going to happen. I mean, like, mm. You know what's going to happen to volatility, and so um, you can you can you know use this as you will, but this premise uh, basically holds true all the time. Um, and rarely, on occasions, I have seen these low volume zones just sort of fill in, where price will fall down into it and then violently zigzag for a while, until it establishes a new peak and it becomes it sh it shifts from a low volume zone to a high volume node. Um, if you go down to the next photo, the next picture down. Let's see. This is actually yeah. a good one right there. That, uh, uh, this thing, before we switch, there's two identifying errors when it comes to low volume. These yeah. two zones right here, my robots would have caught. That gap right there. Yeah. I mean, I actually, if I go to my trader, I think I actually have those. These, yeah. these entries. <laughs> these yeah, it, it's a very popular indicator among like professional traders, but like most of retail has never heard of this and they don't they don't even know to look at markets like in profile, like they do not understand the, the advantages it gives you. Yeah, so go to that second one. So this is the most recent. Uh, let's see, this goes back. This is a four hour. The last one we looked at was a one day one year. This is four hour 180 days. So this is uh, like a few months worth of trading here. You can see that over the last few months, um, price has basically stayed in a range and it's only had a couple of really big moves, but it didn't even manage to leave the range. Like back in <clears throat> June, it had a huge move in June. Um, so that was actually what's called a look below and fail. That is one of the best trades in all of mm -hmm. trading. So price tried to leave the high volume node and it was unable to leave it bounced off the bottom of the high volume zone and the market makers their, their whole goal in life is to find volume right so in the quest for volume they will fight hard and and it, when there's no whales involved market makers are in control of the market when there's whales involved market makers are not in control of the market i just want to be very clear uh they fight very hard to force the price all the way to the other side of the range so that they can find volume because they need volume. They need to transact to make money, right? They don't care mm. what direction the market goes in, but they do care where the volume is. So if there's no whales, the market makers themselves will force this trade just to fix their inventory, just to find volume, all of that. So you can see down in June, between the 12th and the 19th, we had a bounce. Well, to a yeah. normal trader who's looking at only the candlesticks with the volume on the bottom, that just looks like a normal bounce. But to a volume profile trader, it is super clear. Price was trying to leave the node. It was unable to leave the node. And then it tried to force its way back to the center of the high volume node into the value area. So once it got into that value area, it decided to keep going. I have no explanation for why it just did. Once it got to the top of the old value area, it began filling in a new value area above it. And it hung out there all of July. And then it, yeah, and then it fell down uh, from July into August. It fell down into a new value area and filled that mountain in. You're looking at the mountains off to the right. And now it has fallen back down and retested old support. You can see that old support test, uh, 25,000. And now it is ready. We're ready to go off to the races. So there's two things that could reasonably happen from here. We're gonna bounce off the top of the high volume zone and we're gonna bounce off of, let's say, somewhere around 3,200, fall back down, uh, hang out more in the range for longer. Okay, that's that's one possibility. Uh, we'll bust above the old resistance at 32,000. It'll go above it to like, I don't know, 34, 35, 36, and then it'll fall back down and it'll retest the 31,500 to the 32 zone. On the retest, 
that me, that is where I would look to place a trade. I would look for the behavior of it, and I would look for it to either take on bullish characteristics or bearish characteristics. Because right there at the retest is a critical inflection point. Um, let's go ahead and switch to the third chart here. Uh, before we exit, there's yeah. one thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, right here. Uh, just to go back to what you're talking about in uh, June. Yeah. June. If you look at these levels right here, these just the lows. Low, low point, low point, low point, low point. Yeah. The individuals who are shorting down here. They were right covering. Here. Yep, covering right here. Covering, covering right here. Yep, covering. And I don't know. The, I, I can't see it on here because, you know, it's kind of like zoomed in. But if I can get the pip amount, it should be about 30 to 40 pips, mm -hmm. maybe around there. That's so, someone's stop loss. That's also stop loss hunting. <laughs> yeah, I was also going to go every time you see a look below and fail, it's also a stop loss hunt. It's the exact Ooh. same thing. Uh, so <laughs> there's a lot of people that call this same trade by a variety of names. Uh, mm. And that, yeah, that's that's a stop loss hunt. So go to the, go to the third chart. So we just looked at volume profile on longer time frames. Uh, here it is on a shorter time frame. On a shorter time frame, um, I'm used to looking at markets daily. Um, mm. So on a day by day basis, this is the trading. This is the price action of each day. And I know Bitcoin is a continuously traded market, so. What, whatever, there's probably some differences with how you have to trade it. But for the most part, the, the following rules I'm about to tell you uh, will hold true for every market. And I mean every market, like real estate, used cars, everything, not, not, just, you know, like, not just super liquid markets like stocks, bonds, crypto, commodities, futures, all that. It, any market. Um, so let's look at that 1015, that really high volatile day. Um, so this is a day with a fuckload of momentum. Um, there's a little tiny orange dot near the bottom of this. Of Maybe it won't show up very well on the screen. Uh, but price opened up near the bottom of that day and then started filling in a small node there. And then it ripped. And then it went up. And you can see the spike at the very top. Okay, so what that spike is, that is... Uh, bullish pressure. It's also at the same time bearish pressure, right? Because it went up there and then it got forced back down. You see that white box. There's a white box. Yeah, that those white boxes. Mm -hmm. um, those are what's referred to as the value area. That is the that is 66% uh, or maybe it's like 68% one sigma. If you're familiar with how bell curves work, mm -hmm. that is one sigma worth of trading. And so it ends up being like 68% of all the volume for the entire day is inside of zone. is inside of those white boxes. Okay, so the yeah, yeah, the green line is uh accepted fair value for the day. So if you buy below, you can be pretty confident that it hopefully cross your fingers. <laughs> at some point later in the day, the price will go back up and at least you you it will kiss fair value for you. And you will be able to exit at a higher price than you bought in. If you buy, or sorry, if you sell, like if you're shorting, if you sell above those lines, cross your fingers, you can be fairly confident price will eventually wander down there and kiss that price. So a lot of people use fair value as exits. If you're aggressive, you can you can go way past, you can, you know, you're welcome to buy buy way below fair value, try to sell way way above fair value, all that stuff. Um, so the the shape of the volume above and below these white boxes, those can give you indication as to if there was a hard seller or a hard buyer in a market. And um, I'm trying to remember the actual technical term for this. Um, so go look at the one to the left of that on 1016. Yeah, 1016 is a good day to talk about this. On 1016, there was a fuckload of strong selling in the market and there was no impetus for buying. And so you can see there is no tail extending above the white box. So on 1016, the market was telling me, whoa, yesterday went wild. We have to cool off. You're not fucking going any higher today. Don't even bother thinking about being bullish today because there's there's no buying tail on that. That's forcing volume up, right? Price was never forced above value area. Bulls did not step in and force price up. It stayed in the value area all day long. It even went into the next day before bulls push, pushed price back up. Yeah, above value area, right there. Yep. Right here. And so, yeah, those are those are impetus tails. They are not a very strong indicator of anything except for the desire to keep going. 
So if you look over to the right more, let's go over to the most recent day. It has a lot of bullishness in it, and I'll explain to you why. I want to zoom in onto the right. I can't zoom into the right, but I can. Nope. I think it's the most I got right here. Oh, you really can't pan. Point. Can you like pan to the right even just to show nah. show show it zoomed out? No, I can't. I can only zoom in. Can't huh. zoom into like. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh, yeah. Zoom right back out. You were there. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So you can see um, price op of that last day on the far right. Price opened up um, pretty close to the value area for the pre previous four days. So it opened up inside the range and then price forced. Yeah, price was forced up above the range and we have a breakout. And this is a clear breakout. I don't know if the mm -hmm. momentum is going to keep going, but it does look like it because if you look above the value area, you can see that tying, yeah, that buying tail, right? So you can look at the, you can measure the the area of the tail and extrapolate that as an impetus for how much buying pressure there was on the day above and beyond the value area, meaning bulls were willing to take this above fair value for the day because they had buying impetus, right? You can see lots of buying impetus on, on that day, right? The day after that, there was like no buying impetus, then, yeah, then there were some, then there was like none. Okay, the most recent day had so much buying impetus, it forced price up. Price broke above resistance, and it starts forming out a new high volume node right there. So this is looking at volume profile on a daily time frame. It is very powerful for day traders and swing traders. It, this is not so good for, like if you want a dollar cost average into a position, this mm. is actually really good for that, because you can just set limit buys at the bottom of yesterday's value area, and if you don't Got get it. filled... Yeah, and just place it every day. Just just take like a small amount of money and place limit buys into the bottom of yesterday's value area. So the bottom of the white box from the previous day. If you don't get filled, so what? Just the next day, put another limit buy at the bottom of the previous day's value area. Mm -hmm. Every day you do this, you will get statistically slightly better fills than everybody else because you're constantly buying like 1% cheaper. So if you buy 1% cheaper your entire life, let me tell you that compounds. Right, yeah, you know, especially it, off of with Bitcoin's move like that, you can have oh, like yeah. a scalping oh, yeah. position and a, yeah. and a short term position, yeah. scalping and a swing position. So, so looking at markets like this, um, it, it was developed in the 50s and the 60s, and this is like uh, big money institutional traders and stuff. One of the like 10 screens they have up is volume profile, it is always volume profile because it is the only way to look at markets where they will show you recent accepted fair value, right yeah. Still yeah, like, and actually, and it's, break. <clears throat> make it bigger. Mm -hmm. This is this is nice. All right, we get the daily up. Let's go back to here. I wish I could like overlay the charts. That'd be nice. Like overlay the charts on here. Yeah. Um. So trading view doesn't, or not trading view. So Think or swim doesn't do a very good job of that. But there are specific um like futures software, like futures brokerages, that will show you both volume profile and candlesticks at the same time overlaid on top of each other. I, I've seen I've seen lots of photos of that. Oh, so this guy says what what I'm saying is that you can be authentic and get views. You can say I put a thousand dollars into a live trading the robot and got X amount. Find out what the actual is that a video people would watch. I put a thousand dollars into a trading bot and got X amount. Yeah, I mean, when I was brand new to trading, I would have clicked on that. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, I mean, I think I think I just made that live. My robot made a thousand dollars live. <laughs> right, so, so the problem the problem is that live videos have very low retention, and uh, mm. YouTube wants you to make a very short, very edited thing that's basically just like a commercial. You yeah, know, like that, that's what YouTube has evolved into is like watch my eight minute yeah. commercial, and and it's kind of lame, but um, that's why we're talking about starting a podcast where we're just going to chit chat for like an hour to two at a time. Mm. So these last three videos showed my trading robot that my client I made for a client making a thousand dollars in like six days, mm -hmm. six trading days, my bad. And if it's if you want to see it, it's live, you know, it's just like, letting you know. <laughs> but I understand what you're talking about, like like how to like if I go on YouTube like and set type in trading yeah a, a lot of your videos are like how to program a trading bot and maybe you just need to like hook people in just a little bit better before you show them how to program maybe like half your videos should just be like watch my results like 
I live stream every day and you should check out my results. What check out these returns on this bot that I programmed last week. It's tearing mm -hmm. it up. It it's better than my other 50, you know, cuz you have like 50 of these things, right? You program like a new one every 3 weeks or something. Oh my god. No, the ones I make, I I program yeah. new ones for clients. That's what I'm saying. I barely yeah. tweak my old ones. That's that's what I'm saying. Like cuz once you establish them, they they just run in the background for oh, yeah. you just passively trading all the time. Do you mean, turn this, them off? This. Do you have them automatically turn off under certain market conditions? Yeah. So um, okay. most of the robots, there's only a few that trade 100 percent 24 hours a day. Yeah. Most yeah, yeah, robots yeah. turn off and turn on, turn off, turn on. And okay. That's very simple. You guys can do like I'll give you an example of how that looks in code. Well, so for example, because of the indicators that I use, one of my worst nightmares is like during the Silicon Valley bank collapse. Um I trade off of what the, I use the dollar as an indicator and I trade the spy. And uh, during, for like that whole week, um, the dollar was going down at the same time stocks were going down. And all of my indicators were lying to me, all of my, my trading methods, all of my strategy, everything, it was all just losing me money. So um, if you're ever gonna write me a robot, I need, I need to have some stipulations built in where like if bonds are doing this, it doesn't trade. If the dollar's doing this, it doesn't, you know, like anything. So, for example, to make it very simple, and this is why mm -hmm. I like doing things live. Because, mm -hmm. uh, like right now, I'm, I'm, I'll just show you how to do this real quick. So, sure, for sure. example, we use something that's obvious and it's known, it's public. So, I'm not like bullshit. Okay. <laughs> <sighs> Give me a second. I'm going to hit control plus on my other keyboard so I can see uh, the other screen better. Oh, yeah, a second. Yeah, here, let me get fatter. I think it's the biggest I got. Well, no, it's it's on my end. I, I have two TVs here, and they're not both zoomed into the oh, to the man. same amount. <laughs> so what, what I'm going to use is something that's so simple, very common. It's an ATR, right? Mm -hmm. ATR is simple to program, but very interesting, very easy to do. And it's also doing... it's also okay. one of the few indicators that won't lie to you. Yeah, 100% yeah. agree about that. Uh, yeah. Repainting in crypto, I mean, repainting in uh, indicators is so common. Like, I can mm -hmm. show people how indicators will say, one, two, three, four, five, you come back to your desk, you know, after like five minutes, it's like eight, seven, nine, ten. The indicators are allowed to go back and scan, refresh the screen, and rechange their values. And mm. it, it happens like that, like a blink of an eye. And you're like, yeah. how do they do that? It's actually pretty easy. So right now we're looking at double ATR I. This we have the ATR, okay? So what I created before is called an ATR signal. So if the ATR spikes on multiple on multiple uh Time for a multiple period. So you do like a period of three, that's three candles. Uh, let's, just make, let's make it easier. So three, six, nine, it doesn't really matter how long is if you have something that covers a lot of candles. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what ends up happening is that when you have the ATR scan through these values, it has like a, a big spike. What the ATR will do be like, hey, you have a spike, let's pause trading. And what you guys can do to pause trade and be like, just do a bull statement. It means true or false. Mm -hmm. So if the ATR on currency pair, whatever, so you can do symbol. Oh, sorry. You can like change its state or you have a variable that it checks. And if, if it's, you know, if it's the wrong one, like if it's a one or a zero, it'll just back away or refuse to trade. If the symbol equals, I don't know the trading order, but basically you can scan and stop it. And, and it does it thousands of a second. So you can stop trading or what I usually do is this. If there's a big ma massive spike in the markets and you can tell when there's a spike and to make it very simple, I hate using this indicator, you use Bollinger Bands. If it mm -hmm. blows through a Bollinger mm -hmm. Band, for example, what you can do is do a staggered short position. So if it goes down, it'll do short, 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 short. And you're adding thousands of hundreds of thousands, yeah. hundreds of positions. You're, you're, Mart you're martingaling into like a pyramid of, of, of a position where you have way more at the bottom than you do at the top. And your average cost basis is really low. And so it's a bit sell order. Like, I mean, like after a while of doing this long enough, like when, when people come up with type of scenarios, oh, there's things we called oh, oh my god now i have to go through like the basics of programming real quick but when it comes to this right here what i do first when i create a robot for myself i create rules yeah the rules have to be first like it, it's annoying when you see someone program a robot and you don't know exactly what their what what's their intention what like their goals are one. yeah 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 so 
what the first will be this uh protection for spikes for example okay protection for spikes next one would be uh, uh oh protection for flat markets okay so if it's at a ranging market it'll just turn off or or it'll turn on a different strategy like you yep. know strategy a for momentum strategy b for ranging cool so this That's thing will check this thing will check news maybe like five or ten websites all at once uh the next one would be will uh the next one would be very simple be oh oh large spreads if there's a large okay. spread it does not enter okay okay so you've got all these filters and and it, it like you can set these very specific filters it seems yeah i mean what's, what's another oh, oh, oh i love this one equity mm -hmm. if your equity hits a certain point what should i do so if your equity say you have a hundred dollars and it goes down to 99 dollars, 98 dollars yeah. it keeps on yeah. trending it like, will place certain orders pending just to hit back into profit right like a so you're talking about martingaling on your assets for the entire account, or you're talking about per robot, uh, per robot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, each account has a certain limit. So when you have multiple robots, each account will have like a. So you have your baby account. Baby accounts like two thousand to five thousand dollars. That's a mm -hmm. test new robots after six months to a year. Mm -hmm. After that, it runs onto your baby account. Now you're, you're like your king dingling your boss account. That is proven robots only. Like robots have been running for two to three years. That's like five thousand lines of code. <laughs> so once you have something like that, like you have to, like space it out, kind of. So large mm -hmm. equity. Like uh, another one will be. Oh, I love this one. Large Wix. I yeah. love Wix. Yeah. So I measure Wix and see, like, uh, for example, if you're looking at a Wix on the five minute, and you're like, okay, this thing is like that. Mm -hmm. What can I do to measure that? Another thing would be uh, volume. Uh, actually there's so many different types of volume with volatility there's oh man so this is why when i start like when i start breaking down volume in general oh spelled it wrong and this is why if you notice how i program i, I make the most important things first mm -hmm. and this is how i was taught as a uh, when i was like 13 years old to program make your rules first and then after your rules you start breaking down the indicators or such and such mm -hmm. so when this guy's telling me I, maybe i can program better maybe i could but I, I really like every client that watches my videos and contacts me to say the same thing. I like how you just put it this first. It has to be this. So you don't have mm -hmm. uh, what you call uh, programming. Like logic, like, like logic yeah. flow problems. You're avoiding yeah. a lot of logic flow problems. Especially when you start putting bullshit at the beginning yeah. of it instead of the end. I hate when I, when I review people's programs, I'm like, mm -hmm. why are you putting this in the beginning of your, why, you don't even need this here. You don't. The beginning oh. is just for declaring a bunch of variables. Like that's the whole beginning of every program is just like, here's a whole list of variables. I mean, some languages work differently than that, but most of the ones I've worked with. And the thing is, um, oh, oh, I love this part. Passive income. Uh, in, okay. Forex, and, and, and Forex, this has to be known because when you mm -hmm. hold a position, we have stuff like this. Uh, let me show you my trader. Here, I, I'll give you an example. So if you want to buy X currency, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Let's look at the specifications. They will charge you a daily rate. See, like this right here. If you hold a short position, you're going to be paying. They'll pay you 305 points. If you hold a long position buys, they'll charge you daily. So mm -hmm. for me, like I've been holding pound yen since like the beginning of time. <laughs> <laughs> and when I mean that, like I literally, this is like my baby right here. It's not so going I, anywhere. I, I have a, so it, I think it's the SQQQ. Let me look this up before I tell you the wrong ticker. Can I trade that? No, I can't trade it. I got every, I think this is my Germany one. Yeah, yeah look up the long-term performance on the SQQQ. This is one of those things I'm pretty sure that um, here in a few months when rates lower, I'm going to open up a margin account. And every month I'm just going to enter a new short position in SQQQ and I'm just never going to close it. <laughs> yeah. Look, look wow. up what this thing does. Like I, I feel like I'm going to set myself up for like 25 years from now. I have to pay the hugest fucking tax bill ever, but <laughs> I, I don't really care. <laughs> and you know what's interesting? Oh, go ahead. I'll close it the same year that I buy an apartment complex and then I'll use the depreciation from the real estate to write off the, uh, the, the long-term capital oh, wow. gains. Yeah, look it up. Look it up over like the ten years, like like really long term. 
just like this this is one of those assets that I, I just short it once a month and just keep throwing more more short into it like wow. yeah it just goes straight down it just goes straight down <laughs> yeah. yeah look at this thing. just keep zooming out just keep zooming out <laughs> what? yeah 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 it just goes straight down <laughs> oh my gosh yeah it's still going it's still going all the so the, when i tell you this is i feel confident if if i once i start <laughs> like yeah it when when the time comes for me to open a margin account i'm just going to short the crap out of this thing every month more money more money more money <laughs> i don't care <laughs> wow yeah yeah, there's a lot of ways to make money on the stock market. There's a no. lot of ways to make money on the stock market. You just have to pay it's... attention. And eventually these opportunities will jump out at you. Look at this thing it's... curl. <laughs> oh. It's like a reverse hockey stick. <laughs> like, it's interesting. Within this one video call, I have there's more, more value on this call than like most other channels that oh, I've ever yeah. even watched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're not going to get the views. So the guy, if he's still here. No, he, like, he, he, he left. He said it's 3 a.m. I think what you got to do is you're going to have to send this chat off to your editor. And then you're going to have to have him edit down a more entertaining version of it without like, for example, without this conversation. Mm. Uh, yeah. And then you're going to you're going to post like a, a half length version of it. Um, and then that will get views. That will like if we mm. el if we edit out that 15 minute chunk where we just ripped on other YouTubers. <laughs> yeah. And then edit out this conversation and then. uh just leave in all the TA and stuff. Yeah. I mean, it would definitely help, but like, I think the easiest way, if I just go buy Lambo and then like, hey guys, <laughs> all my just Lambo. Buy Lambo. Yeah. And then like, you know what? Shoot. Let's do this right here. Like, you know what? I, I bought yeah. I bought the fancy fucking cars. I mean, I, I bought a, was it uh fucking BMW? It was like 1300 a month for the bill. Mm -hmm. I'm like, like, it's, it's not hard to pay, but I, I had a chance. Like, I don't, why do I need to impress people? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, when we, since we're going to edit out this whole chunk of the conversation anyways, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think when we go to start the podcast, a big part of how we grow the channel and our viewers and our audience will be to invite on other YouTubers and to be the fourth and just rotate mm -hmm. in a steady stream of guests and stuff and just have chats about finance and markets and how, how scummy all the really big ones are because they're trying to sell things that are not worth the value for the price like you know yeah. price is price is what you pay for and value is what you get and if what you're paying for is not worth the value then the person selling it to you is a scum no here we go buddy give me a second my, my yeah, you're are bothering me Vinto, let's go give me a second but you're almost oh what the hell is that give me i mean ah gosh how do i say this I wish, I wish YouTube was different. I wish more YouTubers were like me in the mm -hmm. sense of how I watch. But what I what I've really came together out of these years, like one thing that really just is very different. When I watch different chat groups, like yeah, I don't want to show this THB's chat group, and then if I compare it to my chat group, it's so different. Oh, I bet I would love to get into your chat. I didn't even think about that. Uh... We talk we we talk about things so differently like mm -hmm. these guys only want uh strategical results yeah like, yeah, hey, yeah andre show me a back test of xyz comparing with xyz and how yeah. much money it makes like all right you, you you want another banger look up tza 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 sqqq is not the only thing that you can just blindly fucking short from now to the end of eternity <laughs> there's what? there's quite a few of these <laughs> Yeah, just just keep going back. It's the same thing. How is, this possible? how is this possible? These are triple leveraged ETFs. They decay uh, because of like the, so. How this possible is they have a higher beta than their underlying. So every time their underlying moves up or down, um, they erode. Uh, and, and so like um, so for example, um, if if you lose fifty percent, you have to double to go back to your original value. Does does that make yeah. sense to you? Okay. Yeah. If you I'm if sorry. you lose eighty percent, you have to like five x or whatever to go back to your original value. So the these triple leverage ETFs they move three times harder than their underlying. So their underlying, it'll move down, uh, you know, like twenty five percent and then move up twenty percent and it's at the original value. So the triple leverage ETF that's tied to it, it'll move down, you know, seventy five percent and then on the way back up triple 20 is only 60 percent so it doesn't recover 
it never recovers its original value. Uh, it oh, it will God. it will go against you for short periods of time, like you're seeing that right there, that short period of time. Yeah. But for the most part, over long time periods, this can only go down. The question is, is the question is, is it going to go down faster than its cost to borrow fees? I think so. I've I did the math. Uh, this is a pretty attractive one. Uh, let me look up its let, is, let me look up its annual decay rate. Uh, how is this possible? It's a triple leverage ETFs. Okay, this thing decays at about eighteen percent per year. Oh, hey, you got one of my oh. And the short borrow the short borrow rate on it is only one percent per year. Oh wow, thank you. See, this is why. Uh, my, uh, I wish I could show my channel, my uh, my channel group right here, the discussion. Well, you'll, you'll post it to your Discord. Some of them will sit through it. They, it's actually interesting. When it comes to, like, my video, like, mm -hmm. I'll show you the screenshots. And if they actually screenshot what I talk about, and they'll circle it saying, hey, how do I make this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They want the results. They're after yeah. results. Yeah. Yeah, because when I, when I, if I... There's people inside our current Discord. I'll, I will, I was, I wanted to ask, can you show us an actual printout of that trade mm -hmm. when they claim something? And then, I, I mean, maybe it's because how I'm taught. I'm, I need evidence. I need, I need to see evidence. Well, just as good as evidence, almost. Um, I remember that that time you went on THB's channel, and his his dividend chasing audience just hated the fact that you're a trader. Uh, yeah. And they're, they're like, you know, like, oh, he's a scammer because all traders are scammers. And it's like, uh, no, I'm listening to the what Andre's saying. And I'm like, Andre's making perfect sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love dividends, but I tell you, this is a dividend like a, that I like when they go up in value and policies go up with you. Mm -hmm. Like Biden, I don't want to get into it. It's like I start, I made a video about buying this in 2001, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. 2021. And like it goes up. And it pays like a nine percent dividend. Oh, does it? Oh, wow. Yeah, it that's pays quarter. pretty nice. Pays quarter. I, yeah. I was telling like you have to be like if you have to be like a sniper, you know, mm -hmm. point in your entries and exits. But the reason why I don't like yield max because it, it, if you don't get the good point, then you might get f. Here, I'm not wrong no matter where I go. So with yield max, I just prefer to hedge it. I keep telling everybody to hedge yeah. it and, and nobody understands hedging, like very few people. And so if for, to hedge yield max, you would either buy calls, Tesla calls, or you'd buy Tesla puts, puts or mm. you would short TSLL. All three of those will give you fairly reasonable ways to hedge uh, Tesla's uh, like nav erosion. There. <laughs> I hope it doesn't get but I think the common, like I was saying, I think the commoner buyer, uh, uh, what's the topic today right now? We are Provoco, talking about everything. We're just talking about technical analysis at the moment. We were talking about Bitcoin earlier. Uh, it, it's in the middle of some bullishness right now. It looks pretty bullish for the mm -hmm. last 24 hours or so. Which else? Actually, let me see if I can bring up one of my robots on it right hey, now. Hey, Provoco, do you have any questions about technical analysis or anything like mysteries of the universe you want answered? <laughs> right yeah there's a lot What's there's the... a lot of mysteries with markets you got to do a lot of asking questions and a lot of reading in order to find out like some of the harder to find answers actually can i do rank on here oh i can oh man yeah. trading view has a huge number of indicators but some of them they want you to pay for them pay for indicators that suck <laughs> oh my god me and my uh oh my gosh really i, I such a funny oh my god I, I have such an issue with uh indicators sometimes me and my they lie to me going. that my my indicators lie to me frequently enough that i have decided to switch to using what is probably too many but i don't care because i would rather have the extra filters mm. There's actually there is one <clears throat> there's one indicator that doesn't lie to you, but it, it can mislead you. It's called the four seasons indicator. The four seasons. Oh, I was gonna try to get you to pull up anchored VWAP. Uh show me the four seasons. Um uh, I'm I don't wow. think I'm familiar with it. It it looks like it's a type of Mac D. Okay. Seasons. 
You can't bring it up. I, I, let me hear. Let me bring it up on my computer. Sure. Here, four seasons is one of my. It's a good indicator. It just tells you all the time zones, basically. Pans out all the time zones and gives you highs and lows of each time zone for all of them. Oh. Like Asian high, Pacific high. Okay. Uh, you can do okay. like Hawaii time zone. You can do right. every single right. time zone. So like when the London markets open, you see it, you know. See and everything. When, like you see, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. See, that'd be pretty useless for me because I, <clears throat> I only trade mm. like North American markets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I trade Canadian stocks and United States stocks, and, and that's about it. I don't, I don't touch other other stuff. I don't even really consider Canada a foreign country. I mean, I understand they're they're an independent <laughs> yeah. sovereign nation and all that. I'm, I'm just. <laughs> Their culture is so close to ours that, like, I don't, I don't really consider them foreigners. Uh, I, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> well, oh, it's actually a good question. To be honest, to, uh, to be honest, I'm pretty new to it all. Speaking of status, I'm pretty young right now. Investing, trading, certain capital, or am I wrong? You know what? If I was young, you know, what I would do read, read an read, insane amount of yeah. like everything. Yeah, uh, Provoco, are you more interested in? investing or trading because I, I have books to recommend for both like you know you're either you know trading because i mean if i was 18 again the, the one thing i wish i did more if i can like you know go back in time was read more books <clears throat> uh provoco like i I'm going to invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm a yeah, Seeking I'm Alpha that. author, and I'm a stock picker. And, and I will happily answer all sorts of questions about how to pick out individual stocks. Uh, the short answer is that you want a fairly diversified portfolio, and you want to put most of your portfolio into index funds and a small amount mm. of it into individual companies uh, and, and other plays. Like, like Andre over here has like 5% of his assets in crypto. And, and so you don't want to like go all in on a single asset. Uh, you want to spread out your bets. A and uh, one of the most efficient ways to do that is with an index fund. So index funds also give you the advantage where you don't have to do a whole lot of research. You can just throw money into the spy every year or every day or every month or wh whatever. Yeah. Thank you for the link there. Uh, my advice is to focus on getting a really good education and a good job and make sure that your income is always above your expenses. S&P 500 is perfect for anybody who doesn't want to like spend a lot of time teaching themselves how to pick out individual stocks. Okay, uh, I think I'm about to go. S&P okay. 500, stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. If you want to index fund invest, it's very hands-off and low stress. And and like my father spent decades as a individual stock picker, and then he switched to index fund investing like 25 years ago. And his stress levels went way down. And yes. so the, there's, yeah, stress levels matters a lot. Um, it, there's a couple of good books to read, uh, but for the most part, if you want low stress investing, you just want to just buy the spy your whole life. Uh, but if you want like super normal returns, like if you want to get richer faster, if you want to retire early, uh, my best advice for that is to take something like 20 to 30 percent of your wealth and learn how to uh, invest in individual stocks. What books do I recommend? Okay, so. Behind me, you probably can't see it very well. The blue book is by a man named John Bogle. And uh, that's a good book to read. If you read that book, you basically don't really have to read any other individual investing book the whole rest of your life. Uh, it, it, it just explains to you how to invest into index funds. Very boring, very safe, you know, like, and you're 19 right now. So you, the money that you invest now compounds and it matters a lot more than the money that you invest later. So uh, if you want to learn how to pick individual stocks, um, you're going to need to sit down and teach yourself accounting. Uh, it's not that terrifying. Uh, it, it, most people could do it in a couple weeks or something like that. But then you're, all, you're also going to want to read uh, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Uh, some, some people are after, like I'm an engineer. I like to micromanage and I like to tinker, you know, like why fix it if it isn't working? Well, I could get it to work better, you know, so... That, that's a big part of why I'm an individual stock picker. But most people are not like that and should really just invest into index funds. Um, if you want to invest into individual stocks, 
Peter Lynch uh, has a book called One Up on Wall Street. I recommend everybody start there. And then the Ugh. second the second individual stock picking book you should think about reading is by Benjamin oh. Graham. It, it's called The Intelligent Investor. And that has a bunch of extremely critical concepts that you need in order to understand when a company is cheap and when a company is, is expensive. Oh, and so that you don't yourself. get hosed by the market because the market will lie to you. The market will tell you exactly, exactly the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Peter Lynch went up on Wall Street, Benjamin Graham, the intelligent investor. Um, after you read those and you understand value investing a little bit, the third uh, individual stock picking book to read is is behind me it's the black book it's called the dondo investor uh d-h-a-n-d-h-o it's it's written by a guy named monish Pabrai. um so uh we've been told our entire lives that there's a direct correlation between risk and reward and there doesn't have to be um it, if you if you know what to look for you can buy uncertainty. Uh, Walmart, or not Walmart, <laughs> Wall Street doesn't understand the difference between risk and uncertainty. In it, yeah, and so Wall Street oh will intentionally devalue right. companies down into the gutter if there's a lot of uncertainty involved. And um, so Monish Pabrai talks about like if, if you can come in and and you can see that that it's being devalued not because of risk but because of uncertainty, then you can oh, buy that God. uncertainty. And so he has this phrase where it's like, "Go away, head win, tails I don't lose very much." Do not care. And so that's sort of the, the oh line of thinking God. that you need when you enter into value investing. So um, <clears throat> there's there's a train of a legacy <laughs> thought here. It starts with Benjamin oh. Graham in the fifties. And then it got passed on to Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett went out of his way to go learn from Benjamin Graham how to do all this. And then Monish Pabrai went out no. of his way to go learn from no. Warren Buffett how to do all this. No. Um, and so th those guys are the more famous value investors. There's another train of thought. Um, it started with a guy named Philip A. Fisher. Uh, so back in the day, Benjamin Graham would just plain look for 50 cent dollar bills he'd look for things that were just plain on sale and then he would buy them and he would wait for them to go back up to their fair value and he would sell them so this is a pretty a pretty common strategy buy cheap sell sell later when it's when it's worth more philip a fisher instead of going down that road he would just buy really high quality companies that make a lot of money and he would hold them for a lot of years and uh so this is the other school of thought of value investing the the growth oriented one and that's where peter lynch comes in so peter lynch was more of a philip a fisher style investor and he showed up in the 80s he managed uh, i think it was the magellan fund so for 13 years he had an average return of 29.2 percent and the market only does about 9% a year. So he was beating the market by 20% a year, every year for 13 years. And uh, there are very few people that have managed to pull off. Yeah, very few people that have managed to pull that off or better it. Some people have actually managed to do better than it. Um, and it's because uh, Peter Lynch understands how to value the growth of, of a company. Oh. Like, the future growth of it. The noise. And and he explains it All in right. such a way so that the average person can understand it. So start with Peter Lynch one up on Wall Street, then move into oh. Benjamin Graham, the intelligent investor, and then move into Monish Pabrai, the Dondo investor. And and th those three books, once you get them read, that will teach you how to pick individual stocks pretty well. Um, that That's the core of what I tell everyone is <clears throat> Once you understand the concepts that are in those books, um, you have a much higher chance of beating the market and making good long-term investments. Ooh, okay. You got your books? I think we... Yeah, I just talked about books for 10 minutes. It was good. Your books... I'll, I could talk about books forever. I think... Wow. <laughs> I mean, How much would you say luck is involved? So, um, so wow. that's a complicated question. Uh, if you can remove the luck factor like almost entirely by buying like 20 separate companies. Uh, do your research, do your homework. Uh, out of the 20 you buy, one's going to mm -hmm. fail. Uh, two or three are going to have lackluster performance. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe half of them do pretty well. And then three or four of them uh, out of the 20 are just going to do really well. Uh, and ideally, uh, across your fingers, you end up with a Microsoft or an Amazon in your, in your portfolio 
and you never sell that thing. You you just <laughs> hold on to it for like 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. And and everything like so so one of the core concepts is um you cut the yeah. weeds and water the flowers. You you do not cut the flowers and water the weeds. So once you buy mm -hmm. a company just plain because it's cheap, uh, you have to keep constantly evaluating the quality of that company and how, how their like long term competitiveness. And uh, if they look like they're still competitive, you don't sell. But if if they have some sort of like <clears throat> like let's say their name is Kodak, and and then oh. they get destroyed by digital cameras. You know, or or like Polaroid, and like digital cameras come out, and like they're just getting totally undermined by this new technology. Um, once you Whoa. get into a good a good company, it's really hard to sell it uh, if it honestly is a really good company. Um, and but all the shitty companies, you know, those fifty cent dollar bills that you're just buying because they're cheap, um, they don't have to go back up. So this is something that like Warren Buffett really kind of figured out was like you have to both buy a 50 cent dollar bill and make sure that the company is highly profitable. And if you do both of those things, if you if you play the markets like both Benjamin Graham and Philip A. Fisher, you end up like Warren Buffett. Uh, you, you make a fortune. You end up a gajillionaire. Uh, that, that's the concepts. You know, you could always screw it up. Uh, but that, that that's the. <clears throat> the thing with investing, you're 19, your most powerful thing is time. Time mm -hmm. is on your side. Uh, you have, you know, you could you could think you probably have 40 years to retirement. Let's say you work a, a summer job and you scrounge up an extra like $2,000 to put into the market. Uh, Andre, you're, you're at Google right now. Type in 2,000. Just show him the power of compound interest. Type in 2,000. Oh, compound well, I was just gonna have you have you show it in Google. Oh, off the bat, I was gonna show the because uh, you're, you're you're talking rule seventy two, right? Well, I I was just gonna have you type in two thousand uh, times <clears throat> one point oh nine to the power of forty. One point oh nine, and then upside down carrot will give you the power. Yeah. Yep. Ups. Yeah, to the power of forty. So you're nineteen now. You take two thousand dollars, you throw it in the stock market. When you go to retire, it'll be sixty-two thousand dollars. Yeah, you need to get as much done as possible. More than, yeah, that's probably doing much more than most Americans. <laughs> yeah, well, and and Ugh. all that is that's just buying the spy. That that is just buying mm -hmm. the spy. It goes up about ninety percent, nine percent a year every year. You can expect it to continue to go up nine percent a year for the next forty years. Yeah. Yeah, Provoco, that is a lot of money. And and it started off as $2,000 that you earned from some shitty summer job that you got scooping ice cream or delivering newspapers. And then when you go to retire, that'll be an extra 60 grand there waiting on you. Uh, so so time is your most powerful mm. ally, being since you're only 19. It, it is, that is, that is where you oh. want to be. 19 with a, a huge runway ahead of you and all sorts of time to compound your investments. Oh, and also, if, if, how would I say, if I was 19, some big liabilities to stay away from, like easy liabilities, jewelry and cars. And children. Wait till your 30s. You, if you, oh, wait till oh, your 30s to have kids. Man. Yeah. Kids are the single most, you think college is expensive? Fuck. I, my friends who had kids, they're never <laughs> getting out of poverty. They're never getting out of poverty. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say, if you have kids in your 20s, Make sure yeah. that they're easily financeable. Like just like yeah. Yeah. easily but, financeable. <laughs> you have your twelve year old yeah. operating a lawn mowing business or something. <laughs> financeable. Like, I just said, like yeah. Actually, yeah. Don't, is, don't is have it? kids until you're ready for it. That's definitely yeah. very true. It'll be. Yeah, yeah, Ooh, but, but yeah. Provoco kids can happen accidentally. Like, just be careful. <laughs> that's my that's my that's my advice. Just be careful. You don't want any like happy surprises to show up and, and ruin your retirement. Like just because you didn't get in those early investing years from like 19 to 25 where you're throwing. Okay. So that was just $2,000. Let's say you spend the next seven years throwing $2,000 a year, every year in, and then from 25 on you have kids and are unable to invest those like seven years of investing two grand a year, every year, you're going to end up with like half a million dollars waiting on you for your retirement. And that's if you have kids from like 25 on.
Oh, hey, one of my friends are on here. Look at that. My group's coming on here now. Oh, yeah, see. facts. Have kids when you're ready for them. That's 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 yeah. best advice. Wait a second. But you way too. <laughs> uh, another thing, if I can do, if I can go back, start at 19. Uh, just playing on the safe part. Mm -hmm. Have burn money. Like have yeah. the cash. Like like I don't know. 100. I can't tell you that. This is easy money that's easy to replace to put into something to be flipped. Like oh, if it, oh. you lost the money. Cool. Like, <clears> hey, I wanted to start a easy lemonade stand. Here's five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. oh, I saying, failed. You're saying, in addition to like an emergency fund, mm. having an a, a just in case investment fund where you have mm. a few hundred dollars you could throw into an asset if you see an easy flip. Yeah. Because I'll say, like, man, when I was 19, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I was even younger. I heard about Bitcoin. I bought Bitcoin at like a thousand dollars. I heard Bitcoin at 200 bucks, and I'm like, oh, this shit's a scam, bro. Andre, you don't, you don't even want to hear my story. <laughs> oh my god! And like years later, I'm like I'm creating robots and trading it. I'm like, yeah. I wish I just bought some Bitcoin yeah. at 200 bucks and just waited. Yeah, just waited. <laughs> just waited. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. So, so my 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 wife, um, way back before we were married, when we were just friends, um, she hired someone to mine her two Bitcoin, and he charged her like a hundred dollars. So we're talking like. 2008 or 2009 or something like that yeah she paid she paid a hundred dollars for two whole bitcoin and <laughs> and then uh no one knew how a wallet worked at all for like years so she still has those numbers like written down on a notebook somewhere up in our attic and i keep telling her and i'm like honey i know you keep saying we'll find them when we move but you realize as soon as you find them we get to move <laughs> like it's literally the other way around like if you find those we could move like a week later <laughs> and she's all like yeah 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 we'll find them the next time we move we'll find them the next time we move so uh if bitcoin goes straight to the moon I i'm not going to stress about it but i sure i'm going to stress if my house burns down because i'm going to lose two whole bitcoin look at that <laughs> look at that it's crazy what i yeah. wish i mean i i, I, remember, I remember that conversation hey you should buy bitcoin what the hell is it? Yeah, so, so for me, it, it never set off the scam alarms. It set off the this is too complicated alarms. Like this, there's too much frictional costs. I don't understand how the market works. Like there, there, it wasn't like it didn't set off my scam. You know, like 15 years ago when I first heard about it. Yeah. It wasn't my scam alarms. It set off my like, this is a brand new industry and I should wait alarms. Back to the speech I was giving you at the beginning yes. of the stream. It's like the automotive industry in like 1906. Like this is not an industry, a, a thing to invest into, because we can't tell how the future is going to turn out. Like, we know Bitcoin or we know crypto is going to be a thing. Like, there's no you can't just be like, oh, it's it's all a Ponzi scheme. No, it it has use. It will be around, but we have no clue what it's going to look like in another forty years. You know, like no clue, nothing. Yeah. I I could I could not even tell you what the state of crypto would be like in ten years. You know. So I can't really like long-term invest into something that I can't track its behavior. <laughs> yeah, this would have been in 2008 or 2009 before it was publicly it's, traded. It's, like back before, yeah. Like I know I missed it. I, I mean, I got a part of it, but not the, not the massive move. Like, <sighs> yeah, yeah. Gosh. But to be honest with you, if you had to do one trade right and had a thousand bucks, this was the only thing you would need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, any of the things that should put me avoid Maybe it was, now that I'm thinking about it, because it was not during the 08 crash. This would have been like a year after the 08 crash. So this would have been like 010. I don't think this was in 08 or 09. I think I think when she had in mind it, I think it was like 2010. Wow. This is even before like we have to go to an, another complete different chart just to bring up the numbers yeah, on it, Bitcoin. Yeah, it was it wasn't publicly traded. It was it was like <laughs> only wallet to wallet there was no there were no like exchanges or we couldn't figure it out like 15 years ago yeah gosh. i mean even then i was like uh, for me like with this hearing about the concept you can transfer information across the internet okay cool I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm digging it and i was like and the governments don't know about it i'm not following with you now <laughs> like, yeah yeah it sounds like there's some risk right there no no just buy it and hold it 
But... No, well, same with, you know, same with companies. When I was 17, my father was like, hey, I want to start a Roth IRA for you. Hey, hey, Provoco, look up a Roth IRA. If you're still watching oh, this, yeah. look up a Roth. It's, it's, you want to put your money in a Roth. So he's like, I'm going to start a Roth IRA for you. I want to start you off. I want to put $3,000 in it. What do you want it to go in? And hmm. I told him Microsoft. And he said, no, no, you're not allowed to choose a single ticker. You have to choose like an ETF or something. And he's like, because hmm. he's a Boglehead. He's a John, that blue book up there behind me. He's a John Bogle style investor. And I'm like, but dad, it's Microsoft. And he's like, I don't care. It's a single ticker. I can't let you take on that much risk. And so he he never like made the he never like produced the Roth for me. So um, I missed out on uh, I don't know it's probably hundred x in the since this would have been right before the dot com crash. This would have been in like ninety eight or ninety nine. So because uh, I was seventeen, so Ooh. this was before my eighteenth birthday. And so yeah, and so the problem was I was I was not very experienced at like single stock picking at the time i had read some books but i didn't have a lot of experience and i was unable to explain to him that microsoft doesn't have any like overhead like their costs are mostly just administration costs and then the cost of programming and coding their costs are not mm. like they don't have a, a you know high flat rent they don't have to pay a lot of insurance they don't have a huge factory they have to run when they get done coding up the newest version of Windows, they just send like one copy of it to a distributor, and then the distributor prints like 10 million copies of the disk. So their their actual expenses are like almost nothing. And I couldn't express to my father that they had what is what is referred to as inelastic demand. So people basically have to buy Microsoft. They have a monopoly <laughs> on what they do, yes. right? And so I was unable to express that to my dad, like, you know, like 25 years ago or 20 years ago or whatever, when, um, when I was 17. And uh, I'm biting myself for it now because if, if I could go back and change one thing about my life, it would have been that 10 minute speech I gave my dad. If I would have given it to him just a little bit more clear, maybe he would have moved $3,000 mm. into Microsoft for me in like 1999. <laughs> of course, uh, like a year and a half later when it all crashed, he would have been all like, I told you so, putting your money in a single ticker. Because <laughs> that's exactly, you know, that's exactly, I would have I would have totally gotten the I told you so speeches, for sure. Yeah. Man, I, I mean, like, even for me, like, when I started investing, like, first started reading about it, I was right here. I didn't even know we were in oh, the yeah. uh, crash. Yeah. Didn't even know we were. Yeah, that, that was my second. High school. That was my second crash. I, I started paying attention in, like, 97 uh so so my dad had me take a macroeconomics class as a night class like with him so him and i sat down next to each other you know for this college class when i was 15 and it was so that that i could give him better investing advice uh and then he spent the last 25 <laughs> years just co completely ignoring my advice <laughs> and, and and like let this sink in andre i am a ranked analyst i am beating most of the rest of the analysts on the planet. You can go look. We already looked me up on tip ranks. He still won't listen What's to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nope. I'm, I am I, ranked. I, I am beating. I'm beating like 90% of the rest of the analysts on the planet. And my own father will not put money anywhere I tell him to. Cause, cause he knows better. Cause he's, you know, he's 70 something or whatever, 73. Or something. He's, I, he's got all this experience I, I, I and wisdom feeling, and stuff. Man. Well, I'm over here like this is my third bear market like, that we're in, and this is his like tenth bear market or something. <laughs> Ten. Well, he's he was born in '52. Just, he's been know, investing since '71. How many bear markets have we had since like '71? Yeah, let me go to micro ventures or up here. It's a lot micro trends because I mean I I understand exactly where you're coming from because. Even with me, when I go through people's strategies and they'll ask me like, Andre, do you think this make money? Like, I know you have a big experience. I'm like, this is going to crash and burn your account. <laughs> and then they just do it anyways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So why listen to me? Why ask the question? Why? <laughs> you see, I wish more parents talked to their kids yeah. about finances. Agreed. Yeah. I wish more people did that. And and the public education or, system. Uh, 
they should they should all be taught how to like balance a checkbook and and microeconomics and personal finance, and they should at least have a couple weeks on how to invest. And almost everybody graduates high school just completely yeah. unprepared for the real world. Oh my god! I I mean, I wish that it was like a budgeting class for any high school class, like anything, just budgeting 101. Well, but so after the macroeconomics class that my dad made me take, he signed me up for a microeconomics class the following semester. And then I took economics the next year. So my parents went out of the way to make sure that I was financially literate before I left high school. Okay, Dow Jones, let's just do that. How many crashes we've had or bear markets, but yeah, how many Dang, bear markets have we had since 1971? And so e every time a bear market hits, everybody else is fucking panicking. And my dad's like, cool, I get to buy things on the cheap. <laughs> like, he doesn't, he really doesn't care. It's it's actually pretty hilarious. Yeah, man, the 80s was rough. If you look at the inflation oh. rate in the oh. 80s, we're going through a lot uh, pretty similar to what oh, yeah. they were having to deal with in, in the late 70s and early 80s. I wish. Yeah. Uh, let me bring up the uh, <clears throat> interest rates real quick. Just like that. Interest rates, housing, inflation, historical inflation by year. We bring it up. National debt by year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it just goes up. Yeah, it just oh goes straight gosh. up. This right here. Uh, I, I talked about this on uh, YouTube during COVID about the initial jobless claims, and I got my video deleted. Oh really? about uh job loss in during the COVID, yeah yeah because i i said i, I when people say we're, we're not in a recession to me the recession started during COVID. yeah around yeah. that period and then absolutely we have been free falling i mean i i know we're papering mm -hmm. over everything like literally papering over yeah everything, but yeah yeah it's not just metaphorical we're, we're throwing paper into the market well we haven't been the last year you know but there for two years, we were just juicing everything as hard as we could. And then when they say we got there, oh my God. Uh, that's why I was talking about the other guy. I told him, to me, I have to talk about politics. Politics is like how I trade. It's how I build robots. <laughs> I literally <laughs> add policies in there just to check the news. Just to check the news. <laughs> this is so scary. Yeah, I checked like five different news websites. And my newest website I just got on is called... Um, the epop ep, epop times mm -hmm. costs like a dollar per month to get, but it's highly worth it um so Unbiased the epic... news which is very rare whoa 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 first off everyone is biased and i was just about to explain to you yeah. that are you do you know the story behind the epic times if you're just start now yeah, started reading them huh so yeah, the, i've been following epic... this guy for like 8 years yeah, 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 yeah. Um, if it's the same okay. channel or, or source that I think it is, they're just like super anti-China. Um, so like when I tell you everybody has a bias, uh, their bias just kind of like isn't mm. along our political axis, meaning like they're not clearly super mm. left or super right or Republican or Democrat, but they are super anti-China. Uh, at least that was the, la the last time I checked into their stuff. Uh, they did have they they were running some pro Trump stuff that I didn't care for, but you know whatever. Uh, Trump is gonna. Be, uh, I I, I kind of wish we can choose like a fifth. Uh, I, I was like, hey guys, here's our two front runners. Let's yeah. choose a fifth one with a sixth. Yeah, we, anyone we ranked down <clears throat> here? Anyone? We need ranked choice voting. I, I I hate this whole like only stuck with two shitty choices business. This is no good. <laughs> We got we got disabled man. You might not remember your name, and then we got this guy. I mean, they're both bad, but one slightly less. Why pick any well, it of them? <clears throat> it depends on which flavor of bad you're more pissed off about. <laughs> yeah. that, that's really what it boils down to. It's they they both suck. Which version of suck do you hate more? You vote for the other guy. Oh. Here, look at precious. Oh my god, Here, was was it the Fed, Federal Reserve? Uh, there's a uh, balance sheet. Oh my god! Oh my god! It's like the irritation that's just like bumping in my head. How we? 
I've, I've had so many discussions with these individuals about po politics and they're like, mm -hmm. one's bad, one's right. I say, can we just say that they're both bad? Both, please. <laughs> Let's see how the Fed's going to, this is what, what I, what I want to like estimate is how high their balance sheet's going to go in the next election. Mm -hmm. How much you're gonna have to juice the markets just to recover, just to recover them? I mean, we're going into a recession. Look at pull up the uh, the inverted yield curve, like the two year versus the ten year, and all that oh, stuff. We oh, are going oh, into a recession. There's no, there's no way we're not going into a recession. So literally, every article I've written on Seeking Alpha for the last six months has been because of the impending recession. <laughs> like like the every, the thesis on everyone is like yeah we're fucked uh, unemployment has to go up otherwise inflation won't go down if uh mm -hmm. if they don't force unemployment up then we're going to be stuck with stagflation for like a couple more years and I, nobody wants that the only people that want that are is joe right. biden because the only thing that'll cr drop inflation is if unemployment rises and he doesn't want unemployment to rise going into this next election so you know what? Uh, November fifth, buy puts. Did mm -hmm. you hear that, Andre? <laughs> November fifth, or or whenever we have the election, the day oh, afterwards. This is buy puts. Oh, we have one of we have one other guy talking about Israel. So for me, I have not studied about this, so I can't speak on Israel at all. I have no idea. Like I've been so purposely I'm, avoiding this. <clears throat> My stance is situated thus that it will piss off 100% of everybody who hears it. So I probably just shouldn't talk about the whole situation. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, I'm pissed. I'm pissed at both sides, but for different reasons. Like they both, they've both done horrible things. But mm -hmm. uh, if I go into details, I, I will I will piss off like 100% of your audience. So because everybody's chosen a side, and me over here in the middle, I'm angry at both. So what what am I gonna do? <laughs> I got I, I have it on my to-do list to study more about it, just to understand what's what's happening. It, I want to see the contracts yeah. like two, three yeah. years prior. Because I've been to war, I've seen it. No war happens that same day. It has years of planning. So it's got to wind up. Contracts yeah. of who, and well, the <clears throat> let me tell you, Israel does not need our help dealing with the current situation. Uh, their military oh, is. Gosh clearly sufficient uh what they need is like cheerleading right they need us to give them like moral support they don't really like uh, like a week ago someone was like oh my what's gonna happen is israel in danger and i'm like let me tell you something <laughs> israel has a strong military for how big it is is it a distraction you mean like from the ukraine war or from from other things i i really don't think is it a distraction it probably has to do with some internal political strife in israel that we're not really familiar with because we're we don't live there like some sort of internal stress oh, something i mean i how do they do this like i'm, I'm looking at the new quick because remember I, i'm new to this topic i'm not a professional at this right here i, I have not but i just find it details of biden's 105 billion dollar funding request for israel and ukraine wow. yeah so um the gist is yeah, the the gist is he tries to get Congress to approve it, and then we don't send them cash; we send them arms, like physical weapons, and then the money goes straight into our companies. So this hundred and five billion dollar thing, it's a subsidy for like Raytheon. How many different um, mm -hmm. industrial, military, industrial complex companies are there besides just Raytheon? I mean. <clears throat> we could pull up a uh, list. Lockheed is what Martin. I'm Lockheed, yeah, Boeing. Yeah. You know, there's there's like a half a dozen of these companies that are just gonna see huge gains off of any sort of military surplus or a military, you know, Not stimulus. That That's this is a stimulus for the military. And, and one thing I'll tell you about being in the military, we you know Lowe's. So Lowe's will have a screw for like five bucks in the yeah. military. Same exact screw. Two thousand dollars, a thousand dollars, exact same screw. Yeah. Highly engineered uh, ashtrays that are mm -hmm. specifically designed to break into three pieces without small small bits of glass all over the place and stuff. Safety glass. <laughs> God, oh my God! You know, uh, yeah, I had some so, goggles. So, you know how much goggles cost? Like two bucks, maybe, right? Three bucks. Like same goggles glasses. in the military. Yeah, yeah like a hundred bucks. I've ordered yeah. it in the military. Yeah, because they're like 
shatter resistant plexiglass or something, plexiplastic. So that's what I was saying. 61 billion for Ukraine, 14 for Israel. Israel doesn't really need money. Uh, the, the, their military is easily capable of handling the current situation. It, they would be easily capable of handling an escalated situation. Like they could go to war with half of their neighbors and be just fine. How is this possible? 17, 7.4 billion for Taiwan? And yeah, we're shoring up Taiwan. We're worried that um, China is going to invade Taiwan in the next like few years. So we're giving Taiwan additional military aid now to prevent, like, it's a preventative measure. Sure. I mean, when you start looking at the focus of this $105 billion, it's very interesting. Like, where is, so how do I say this? I do not like the government doing stuff like this, but at least help your own people first. Because if you like this, yeah. thing, like a percentage thing, like, okay, Ukraine, Israel, so foreign, foreign, the United States, foreign, foreign. The border security thing is, is this is the border security is literally the dumbest argument our country has. And, and let me explain why. Uh, everybody who's arguing about building a wall or not, that is the type of stance that you take if you employ illegals and you want to look like you're trying to stop them getting in the country, but you don't actually want them to stop getting in the country. Like, say, for example, Donald Trump. Building a wall is a Donald Trump plan because if you actually wanted to stop them showing up, you would just punish employers who hired them and then make it super crystal clear, don't bother showing yeah. up to the U.S. without a green card because you won't find work. If you actually wanted to stop illegal immigration, that is all it would take, is punishing employers. I'm talking oh. about finding hiring managers, throw his ass in prison for a month, watch him never hire another illegal alien again. Yeah. That would fix, fix the problem in a heartbeat. If they stop getting out free cell phones and free rent money, because I've seen this personally, uh, during President Obama's term, they were giving out Obama phones. So when people came across the border, they got cell phones. Yeah, I, uh, I had money. a couple. I had a couple of friends talk to me about the Obama phones. They weren't trying to get me to use them. They were trying to get me to avoid them. Like they mm. kept telling me things like, "We are pretty sure that there's going to be like encrypted spyware on these, and if there's not software that's spyware, <laughs> there might be hardware that's spyware. So if you accept an Obama phone, you should probably just." give it away to somebody you don't care about or something like, cause uh, whoever uses this thing is probably going to get spied on for the rest of their life. Yeah. But I mean, it's interesting. Like when I look at immigration in other countries, they are very strict, like not just strict. Like you talking about prison time here. So, we... uh, a lot of it comes down to how, if your economy needs immigrants or not. Um, so we actually need a small amount of immigrants uh, to maintain a healthy economy, you know, like 1% a year or something like that. Uh, or half a percent a year. I don't really know what the number is. You can talk to an economist, but um, there is a specific amount of immigration that constitutes the most healthy amount. Uh, and and mm. and that's for our economy, right? And that's also based off of things like birth rates. Like if, if our birth rates drop too low, we need to have immigration in order to offset that. So some countries, um, it's very strict for immigration and some countries, they are desperate to get people to move there. Uh, personally, I think we should hand out more work permits, like to people that show up that are desperate. Uh, mm. I think we should hand out more work permits and give them an opportunity, like a <clears throat> a more clear path to citizenship, where they don't just spend yeah. fifteen or twenty I'm, years, like in our country, as an illegal. I would I would rather make the process easier so that they can eventually become citizens, assuming they don't join a gang or rob banks or you know any of that shit. I just know almost I mean, almost every American here in this country now is an immigrant. You know, very few of us are native. Wow, we all, I mean, if we made it easier, I would agree. But I, the one thing that I, I know these border states are having problems with is the oh, they're having much, drug problems. Yeah, yeah, Texas is having huge problems with immigration. So I'm not going to sit here and say it's not a problem. But where I live in Ohio, it's it's not a problem. Uh, but if I lived in Texas or Arizona oh. or New Mexico or something, oh, I would be much more concerned about it. I don't know. I don't know. I my, 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 my army is coming. Yeah. Oh, my God. Your little proto-investors. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they, they own like six companies each. They have ownership in all these other companies. And they have their own brokerage accounts. Your kids? 
Yeah, I, I put them in even their own funds. Have their own okay. funds, own trading accounts, everything already built out. Huh. And, and I told them, like, it's, it's, it really wasn't that hard. The only hard yeah. part is getting their foreign accounts hard. The foreign accounts yeah. are a pain in the ass. Yeah, a, a lot of people will like buy their kids bonds, but they don't realize what a horrible investment <clears throat> bonds are. <laughs> like they buy their kids a 20 year bond and they're like, oh, look at this. I'm going to teach them how investing works, except like bonds haven't been attractive since like the 70s. <laughs> like, like it hasn't right. been the time to buy bonds for like 50 years. They've only just recently mm -hmm. become attractive in the last year because rates went up. <laughs> rates <come laughs> like, yeah, the bond, the bonds, the value of bonds, the returns on bonds are directly related to, to interest rates. And so when interest rates go up, the value of bonds go down, but the amount that they pay go up and the amount that they give in returns on their way to maturity, that goes up. So the higher the higher that rates are, the more you should just buy bonds. Like if Jerome Powell takes rates to like 17% and has to Volcker the market again, like like what Volcker did in the 70s, during that month, you should just buy all the fucking bonds that you can because that's the cheapest they're ever going to be ever our entire life. If, if we ever see interest rates up in the teens, just buy the TLT because it, it'll get pushed all the way. To, are you writing me writing down what I'm telling you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is actually kind of interesting because there's two perspectives when it comes to that. When it comes to one, buying bonds and two, uh, oh, this is that possible. Do we have that much fucking people coming in this year? How's that possible? Fifty million people in immigration? Yeah. Whoa, whoa, that, that's not per year. That's total. Total. Total number of immigrants. A sixth of our population immigrated here. Four uh, hundred. Uh, Andre, when was the last time you were in New York City? <laughs> it's I, like I would, I would, it's I like it's like two thirds people that were not born in the United States. <laughs> Wait. If we're so Americans' population is going to hit 400 million in a roughly next couple of years, just from through immigration. Whoa, this is crazy. I don't know if this article is, or this thing is fact checked, but this is like just rough numbers, guys. But, I keep telling you to buy land. Oh, I'm not a land guy. I, I know, I know. I like digital computers and like, like yeah, as long as I can stay home. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I'm just saying, you know, buy land. They're not making it anymore. They they stop making. <laughs> they stay. It's a, it's a Mark Twain quote. <laughs> yeah, buy land. They stopped making it like hundreds of years ago and shit. <laughs> it's a collector item. Oh, why land? Um, so Malthusianism. Um, so Andre, pull up Mal yeah. Malthus or Malthusianism. I I'm I'm not really sure how to spell it. Malthusian. Malthusian theory. Yeah, yeah, that's the guy. Um. So as population rises, go ahead and click on images. I'm going to look for some kind of a chart. Let me see. Oh, Br uh, Britannica is on there. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So all these are basically describing the same situation. As population mm -hmm. rises, our ability to meet our needs with our current resources is going to become a larger and larger problem. And uh, so we only have so much land to go around. And the, the core problem here is we're already farming the best farmland. So if our population nope. goes up by 50%, we don't just have to find 50% more farmland. We have to find more than 50% more farmland. So what, what do you think is going to happen when our population doubles? How much, how much is farmland going to be worth like 50 years from now? I'm pretty sure that the global population is just going to keep climbing, especially in, in like more developing countries and stuff. And we are just going to have a steady stream of immigration as much or as little as we want. Like uh, our ability to just shut off the faucet and then turn it back on at will will be there for at least another hundred years because we have the strongest economy on the planet. <clears throat> and it's going to keep going that way that if we want more people, we can we can accept more people. Um, but our ability to provide land for all of these people is quickly running out. Um, the, the value of land doesn't exactly go up fast, but as more people acquire more land, and the great thing about land is it is the ultimate hedge against inflation. It is it, like, it doesn't matter what money does. Land is land. I mean, there are very few assets that have the appeal of, of land, like gold the, the, like what else um what else will never lose its luster 
will forever be in demand. And they quote unquote, they stopped making it a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, like let that sink in. They, the, we stopped producing new land for us to colonize like 400 years ago or something. Like when did the colonial era actually like stop? Maybe like um, South America and Africa were kind of like the last two places that we really colonized uh, as, as a species, like with industrialism. Just, just thinking about farmland. Oh, just farm me. Yeah. Oh, actually, I, I gotta go. I got my. Okay. Coming. Yeah, we can wrap it up. Okay. All, all of you that are finally sat through to this ending, uh, have yourself an excellent night. Uh, hopefully, Andre's kid's gonna have a better night. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. But I'll see you guys later. Please subscribe yep. to both our channels, and that was an awesome TA video. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a chat about a bunch of different stuff. Have a good night, man. Let me see in stream.